one of the four Sundays, we have this immensely popular talk on scientific subjects, sometimes introducing us to the latest uh, things that are being discussed in the media, and sometimes introducing somebody's uh, lifetime research work. And it's gratifying to see that post-pandemic, with every passing uh, copy with curiosity session, more and more people are turning up to this event offline. And of course, even the online population has increased. So we hope that this trend continues. So on behalf of uh, Jawaharlal Nehru Planetarium and uh, International Center for Theoretical Sciences, ICTS, I extend a very warm welcome to you all to this uh, program. And uh, the topic itself is very, very interesting. Black holes, quantum mechanics, and the reversibility of time. I think these are three magical words. Anything to do with space, time, gravitation, black holes, it draws people in large numbers, just like those entities do. And we have uh, uh, Professor Suvrat Raju from uh, ICTS to give this talk today on this particular topic. Sir, a warm welcome to you too. And, uh, A quick introduction about the speaker. Uh, Professor Suvrat Raju is a theoretical physicist at ICTS of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. He works on string theory, quantum gravity, and quantum field theory. He obtained his PhD in 2008 from Harvard University. His work on quantum aspects of black holes has been recognized by the Swarna Jayanti Fellowship 2017 the ICTP Prize 2019, and the Nishina Asia Award 2022 that he received uh, just about a month back. Uh, so we are really honored to have you to have this, uh, you deliver this talk. So I request uh, Professor Subrat Raju to make his presentation. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, thank you very much uh, to the planetarium uh, and to the organizers at, uh, in the outreach team at ICTS. Uh, can you hear me clearly at the back? Yeah, uh, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, uh, thank you to all of you uh, for coming here uh, on a weekend uh, and I'll hope to try and uh, make it worth your while. Uh, so this is supposed to be an informal talk. Uh, it was supposed to be this year, although I noticed I've already time traveled and put a date from last year. Uh, but uh, this is supposed to be an informal talk. Uh, so, you know, please, uh, please feel free to uh, stop and, and ask questions. Uh, I tried to organize it so that at least the first part would be understandable uh, to as many people as possible, including my nine-year-old son, uh, who's here on the promise that some of it would be understandable to him. Uh, but, you know, if I've, if I've missed that, like, please feel free to collect, correct me and ask questions so you know we can have a conversation rather than uh, just having a lecture okay okay so uh, as uh, 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 you know as was said earlier uh, there are all sorts of words uh, you know in this title uh, which talk about black holes and quantum mechanics and the reversibility of time uh, but uh, the way i would like to uh, introduce this subject uh, is by thinking about a really simple system okay in which uh, we can already see uh, some aspects of the physics that I want to talk about, which is something which is very familiar to us, okay? So the question, the first question, you know, which uh, is already tells us about some of the phenomena we are looking at is uh, the kind of question which, yeah. Okay, is, is this kind of a question, okay? It's just a question about projectile motion. So this is uh, something that all of us are familiar with, our, our favorite sport. Uh, I stopped watching it, uh, but you know, when I, when I used to watch it, uh, Murli Tharan was, uh, was, was, the, was the bowler who was the best bowler in the world. And, uh, you know, the kind of question that, that, that uh, we, we ask in theoretical physics is in some sense continuously connected to some very simple questions that one can ask uh, about this ball that the bowler is bowling. Okay? So the kind of question that, that one can start by asking, which one learns how to uh, address the moment one learns physics is, you know, let's say you have a ball like this ball that's being pulled or the ball that's here. Right, and you throw it up with some speed, and uh, you want to ask, how far uh, does the ball go? And you know, where does it land? Uh, you know, if how, what angle do I need to throw it uh, for it to go the furthest, and so on. Right? 
and there are some equations that that describe this uh, uh, which are equations that that you know uh, those of us who studied physics understand but even otherwise uh, you know these equations are pretty simple to understand and they tell us that you know well this ball is to first approximation in the end the cricket ball does many complicated things it spins and swings and so on uh, but to first approximation when this ball moves in in a plane and in this plane there is some vertical motion and that vertical motion is you know this the bowler dropped the ball from some height or you know I threw it up at some height and then there is some initial velocity in that direction and then there is some acceleration uh, due to gravity. So, we already see where gravity shows up here and this tells us you know what the ball is doing as a function of time right? and then there is just the horizontal motion which is just this motion which is the fact that you know the ball just moves in some steady velocity in that direction and of course you know you can correct that and you do need to correct that and a lot of the interesting aspects of, of a cricket as a sport is about how these things get corrected by the wind and by resistance and by the ball bouncing off the pitch and so on. But in fact this is still a pretty good approximation uh, to how this ball behaves or how this ball behaves and so on right. Okay, now this very simple system that all of us are familiar with is already useful uh, to demonstrate a few things okay, which which will be important as we go along. One of them is that you know these equations are obeyed not just by this ball but by any ball and in fact by any object including us. Okay. So this is another example right this is now a human being who is being launched uh, from a cannon uh, and this is uh, one of those stunts called a human cannon ball and in fact this human being obeys the same equations that the ball does. And it is pretty important we get those equations correct because the way this stunt works is uh, this person is launched from a cannon and there is a net on the other side and the person has to land on the net and you know if you get the equations wrong if you do not realize that you know there is acceleration due to gravity or if you do not realize that there is some other effect uh, the person you know the person does not survive the stunt. So, it is very important that these equations work they work very accurately uh, they work not just for balls uh, they work. Uh, for, for, for people, they work for rockets, you know, they work in all, all sorts of settings, okay. And so, this is already something that is important which is that there, there is there is various physics that sometimes you learn that you know applies to certain kinds of systems, to projectiles, to cannonballs, to bullets and so on. But in fact, it is important that the same kind of physics applies across scales, okay. So, often you make a discovery in, in one setting, but it is not that things break completely. Uh, I will describe how things sometimes change completely as you change scales, but it is not like things break completely as you go to a different scale ok. And that is not how it is in in all sciences right. Sometimes uh, if you are doing if you are doing like sociology uh, the way groups of three people interact is very different from the way groups of 100 people interact as here which is very different from the way groups of million people interact. Uh, but physics is a simple subject in some sense I mean that is part of its beauty and so the equations that work for balls also work for us if one of us was put there ok. So, that is one thing uh, which is a useful thing to realize uh, not always stated but an important thing that will underpin what I say ok. That is one one point I want to make using this very simple system. The second point is that often the way we think about these equations by the way the form of the equations is not important for those of you who, who do not like the equations. Uh, but the way we think about you know how physics works is that you know you project this person or you throw this ball and you want to ask you know where will the person land right? that is the kind of question that is important for, to save this person's life. You have to make sure that the person lands in the correct spot. But there is another aspect of the story which is if you knew where the person landed and with what velocity you can also predict where the person came from ok. So, that is the second aspect which is very important which is the aspect of reversibility in physics ok. It is the fact that you know often you think of physics in terms of making predictions right. You say I am going to make a prediction in that you tell me the initial conditions, you tell me what speed I threw the ball with, you know how high I threw it and I will tell you where it will come down right. But there is another aspect which is I could also have told you how hard the ball was coming down when I caught it and I can use that to predict how hard the ball was thrown. So, physics does not only work in terms of evolving forward in time, it works also in terms of evolving back in time. This picture is a picture of Sherlock Holmes uh, of whom I am a great fan 
And, and this picture is from the original illustration in the Strand magazine, uh, which is where, you know, these Arthur Conan Doyle first published these stories. It's from a story called The Adventure of the Dancing Men. Okay, I don't know uh, how many of you have read it. Uh, but the story is as follows, okay, there's, there's some, some, you know, there's some code and there are various aspects to the story. But at this point in the story, there's uh, a man who's been murdered and a wife who's critically injured. And the wife is suspected of having shot the man dead, okay, or, and then maybe shot herself or something like that, okay. So wife is suspected of being uh, guilty of the crime. Okay? And what Sherlock Holmes does is he looks around and he finds a bullet, you know, and he says, you know, this bullet could not have been fired from where the wife was standing. And this bullet must have been fired from outside the room where these people were in. And then he goes outside and he finds the cartridge. He finds, you know, uh, some sign that the bullet was, was fired there. So this is Sherlock Holmes picking up, you know, the spent cartridge from outside the room where the murder happened. The murder is supposed to have happened inside this room. Okay? But this is an example of how reversibility is important, right? So here it wasn't important for Holmes to know where the bullet would have gone had it been fired, but it was important for Holmes to be able to back calculate that look, if the bullet landed up here, it came from somewhere else. Okay? And this is something which is still important. You know, it's, I mean, Sherlock Holmes is a fictional story, but this is really something that is, that is done, right? If you have an accident, uh, you try and look at the tire marks and so on. You try and ask, you know, where did it come from? And, and in fact, these things themselves are, are often done. Uh, I don't know much about criminology, but if, you know, if you look at arms control and so on, you look at where, you know, some weapons, uh, where some munition landed, you can try and back calculate where it came from. So back calculating is in fact something that's very important. And physics works not only for calculating forward in time, but it works equally well for calculating back in time. Okay, so things are reversible. In fact, there's a very fundamental principle of physics, which is that everything, okay, all of physics is eventually ultimately believed to be reversible, okay, all physical processes. So that might be a little puzzling um, because, you know, uh, we often think of, think of, you know, phenomena which is, which are, which are not reversible or, and, and I'll come to that in a minute. But, you know, if you just think about, go back to this simple system which we've been discussing now for a few minutes. Uh, and you look at these equations, uh, then you see these equations, uh, you can start at t equal to zero and evolve forward. So let's say you start with z zero being up here. You can start with t equal to zero and evolve forward and evolve this way, or you can evolve backwards and you can see where the ball came from. Okay? But this is also true of more complex phenomena. This is an example of a phenomena that on its surface seems to be not reversible. This is a, a ripple in, in water. It's a kind of ripple that would emerge here, right? If I, if I uh, hit this, you'll see, I mean, there are ripples that will emerge here. And in fact, physics uh, will let you compute uh, if you know the properties of the water and, you know, you understand properties of this bottle and so on. Uh, if you hit it some, with some amount of force, you know, what kind of waveforms will be produced, right? That's the kind of thing we can compute. In fact, it is also in principle possible to try and compute from the ripples that were formed what kind of impulse created those ripples. Okay? So this is an example of a situation where it's much easier to calculate forward in time than it is to calculate backward in time. Okay? In this system, uh, if you drop something, you drop some stone and imagine that that stone led to the formation of the ripples, it's easy uh, to calculate forward in time and that, you know, you can calculate how the ripples spread outwards. But if I give you this picture and ask you to calculate you know, what was the st velocity of the stone that caused these ripples? That's something that's hard to calculate. But, and this is very important, it is believed in all physical systems that we have any experience of, it is believed that it is always possible to back calculate what led to these ripples, provided you keep track of all the information that is present in the system. In this situation, the claim would be, that if you kept track of every little detail of these ripples, if you kept track of, you know, how the ripples were propagating, what the phase was, you know, everything, uh, what was happening at the edges, then you would indeed be able to back calculate what it is that led to those ripples. Okay? And so sometimes it looks like in everyday systems that information is lost, that, you know, it looks like you can calculate easily forward in time and not so easily backward in time.
But in fact, we always believe, or we believe this is a principle that is true in every experiment we have done, that at a microscopic level, okay, at a very fundamental level, you can always calculate both forward and backward in time. Sometimes it might be harder to calculate backward in time, sometimes it might be harder to calculate forward in time, okay, but it is always possible to evolve systems in both ways. Okay. So this is an important principle that's true not just of balls and projectiles, but it's true of all systems uh, that we understand. Okay. And the processes that we think of as irreversible processes, which is a word that's used, uh, just means that it's very hard to reverse them. Okay. And we never mean that it's impossible to reverse processes. There are no processes uh, that exist within the realm of physics as we understand it uh, that are irreversible processes, that are fundamentally irreversible, okay? Okay, so these are some, some you know, very basic points I wanted to make. Uh, once again, if I'm losing people or if there are questions, uh, you know, just feel free to put up your hand and ask questions. I'm happy to take questions along the way if some of these things are unfamiliar. You have a question? Yeah. Uh, can I actually calculate as in me? <laughs> or or can, is, it, is it possible in principle? Uh, it is possible in principle is the answer. The answer is that if you keep track of every little aspect of the ripples, and so for instance, okay, let's say I roll this ball, right? And, it, and if I roll it with some speed, like I can calculate where it will where it'll go, right? But I could roll it and maybe it comes to a stop. And now you could have asked me, you know, can you tell me with what speed you rolled it in the first place, right? And that's a very hard calculation. It's not easy to determine it. But if you keep track of everything, you keep track of what's happening to the table, you keep track of what's happening to the bottles, you, you keep track of all the information that you have, then we believe it is sufficient to use that information to reconstruct what happened to the ball, how the ball was sent. Now in this case, this is not a calculation that is practically possible to do. So the way we come to this conclusion is by imagining, is by thinking of a lot of much simpler systems. And in those simpler systems, we find that whenever we can calculate, Whenever you keep track of all information and you don't lose information, you can always evolve, calculate forward in time and calculate backward in time, okay? So, so, so that's always possible when we don't lose information. Sometimes it's very hard to keep track of information, right? Because this ball rolled and now I don't know, you know, what happened to the air because I don't have detectors in the air, I can't see that. And so I don't really have the information I need to calculate back in time. But if someone were to give me that information, then we believe it is possible to calculate back in time. Yes. Bookkeeping. Yeah, so we are not, never talking about going back in time or going forward in time. We are just talking about the fact that physics lets you predict, like if I throw it up, when it will come down. So I don't have to go forward in time. You know, I know it's going to come down after some time, right, before I catch it. And it also lets you predict, retrodict. So physics allows predictions and retrodictions. Sometimes retrodictions are harder than predictions but they're always possible in principle. That is because the fundamental laws of physics are of this kind, you know, which tell you that there's some evolution as a function of time and you can put time to be positive or you can put time to be negative and you can evolve forward or evolve backward. There is nothing in the fundamental laws of physics that's different as you evolve forward or evolve backwards, okay? Okay, good. So now I'm going to introduce another concept using my, my favorite simple system. Which is, so I, uh, we already talked about reversibility, now I'm going to talk about something else, which is the idea of an escape velocity, okay, which will also be important. So the escape velocity question is the following question. Okay, let's say I throw this ball up with some speed. So it goes up to some height. Let's say I throw it up with twice the speed. Do you know how much higher it goes? Half, no, I'm throwing it up with twice the speed, so it can't be half. If I throw it up it twice, 1 plus 0.5, okay, you have a guess, yes. 1 eighth, 1 eighth is also not correct, neither is 1.5. Someone know, if I throw it up with, so I throw it up with some speed, this is the question, I throw it up with twice the speed, how much higher does it go? Four times, exactly, right? So, so the answer is, the naive answer is that if you throw it up with twice the speed, it goes up four times as high as it did earlier, okay? That's, these, using these equations, you can actually calculate, and that would be, and that is indeed true, right? If I take this ball and I throw it up with this speed, it goes here, and if I throw it up at twice the speed, then it goes up like four times as high, okay? 
Okay, good. Now, but the fact is that in fact, if you start extrapolating this, if I start throwing the ball up like higher and higher and higher, I mean not, I can't do it, but let's say I had a gun that could throw things or project things, or I had a cannon that could project things at higher and higher and higher speeds, you would find that this rule, that if you throw things twice as high, they go four times as high, uh, if you throw things twice as fast, they go four times as high, actually will start to break down. And in fact, things will go a little bit higher. Well, in the beginning, things might go a little bit lower because of air resistance, but imagine we are doing this experiment somewhere in outer space, okay, where, or not, not in outer space, in some long, long vacuum tube, okay, which goes all the way. Okay. Or imagine that, you know, we have something where air resistance is very small, we have some very aerodynamically designed rocket or something like that. So eventually, the point I want to make here is that this, this rule that we have, you throw things twice as fast, they go four times as high, starts breaking down and things go a little bit higher. Okay? And the reason things go a little bit higher is because, remember in these equations I was showing you, what controls how fast things come down is something called the acceleration due to gravity. Okay? And that acceleration due to gravity, which has roughly you know, 9.8 meters per second square on the surface of the Earth, becomes weaker as you go higher and higher and higher. Okay? So the force of gravity, the gravitational attraction that the earth exerts on this ball if you throw it higher and higher, becomes slightly weaker. Now while we are on the earth and while we are, you know, not very far away from the earth, while we are within, within this room or, you know, even up to, up to 10,000 feet or whatever, this is something that's very hard to measure. But eventually this is something that becomes more and more important. And so if you were to try and calculate, you know, do a more precise calculation of what would happen uh, to these projectiles as you launch them with larger and larger velocities, then this is the rule that was, we just discussed, which is, you know, things, if you throw them twice as fast, things go back, things go far, four times as high, which is what one might call a quadratic rule. And this is the rule that you would get from a more precise calculation, this red curve. And the interesting thing here is, eventually, if you launch a projectile with enough speed, if you launch a projectile with enough speed, it will never come back. Okay? It will escape the gravitational pull of the earth entirely and it will just never come back. Okay, and that speed is called the escape velocity and it's roughly 11.3 kilometers per second. Okay? So if you were to launch an object, which you know, I can't do with this ball because I don't have enough strength, but if you were to launch an object uh, with enough speed, uh, then eventually, uh, you know, it would, it, would, it would just keep going and it would never come back. Okay? So there is th th this concept of an escape velocity, which has to do with the fact that the force of gravity of the, due to the Earth is not a constant and becomes weaker as you go further and further away from the Earth's surface, okay? Okay, so this brings us in fact to another phenomenon. You know, I said in the beginning that, uh, you know, we had, um, uh, in physics, things work at different scales. Uh, what works for the ball also works for human beings. But eventually, as you start pushing things, you'll find that, you know, uh, this rule that you had that, that worked for balls uh, stops working once you go to certain limits. And then something else takes over which is more accurate. And in fact, the thing that takes over with which you can already calculate the escape velocity of the Earth is something called uh, the Newtonian force law, okay, which is something that uh, was discovered again about uh, 350 years ago and is sufficient uh, for helping us calculate what happens as you throw things and, you know, if you wanted to escape the gravitational field of the Earth. So Newtonian force law is something that tells us that, you know, if you have two objects, uh, like the sun and the earth, or maybe like the earth and this ball, then there's some force between them. So, you know, so far we were just talking about kinematics, uh, what happens to balls as you throw them. Uh, but now, uh, you know, the, the Newtonian force law came and organized this in a slightly different way and said, you know, if you have two objects, then these objects, there's some force between them. And that force is proportional to the product of the masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. And then the acceleration that this earth feels is proportional to this force, okay? So the mass of the earth into the acceleration uh, that the earth undergoes is proportional to this force. And this is a very successful theory because it's something that works not only for the balls that we are throwing about, but also works at a much larger scale for the, at the planetary level and at the solar system level, okay? And uh, this, uh, uh, the reason, you know, uh, this reduces to what we were discussing uh, with, 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 with cricket balls or with, with balls of this kind or with human cannonballs is because when you're on the surface of the earth, this distance between you and the, the center of the earth is almost a constant. 
okay. So, if I am here or if I am here, the distance between my hand and the, and the center of the earth is always about 6400 kilometers and whether that's 6400 kilometers plus 3 feet or minus 3 feet does not really matter, okay. And so, the acceleration due to gravity that you feel on the earth's surface is due to an approximation that you can make for this law which has to do with the fact that you are often in a regime on the earth where this distance is a constant and therefore, you see some constant acceleration due to gravity that does not vary with heights and that you would not see unless you started pushing heights to a higher and higher distance, okay. okay. So, now this is a very, very successful law, you know Newtonian gravity uh, is something that was discovered 350 years ago and it is one of the most successful laws, one of the most successful, you know, not laws but rules of physics that, that is known to humanity. And the reason it is so successful is because it works for a remarkable variety of length scales. You know it works for this cricket example that we discussed, it works for this human cannonball example that we discussed, it is good for predicting how rockets will go to a good extent. You know it was developed by understanding how the earth would go around the sun and how planets in the solar system behave, but the same rules will tell you how the moon will go around the earth, okay. So, you now have something that is applicable even more broadly than the initial kinds of equations we were talking about and that works on a very, very large variety of scales. Okay. So, this is a very, very successful theory of gravity that we had and that held, you know, that was known to be as accurate as possible uh, for more than. But then uh, about a hundred years ago, people realized there is something slightly unusual about this theory of gravity. Okay. And what is slightly unusual is roughly the following. Okay. Remember I said that the force between uh, the earth and the sun uh, was proportional to the, the uh, product of the masses and inversely proportional uh, to the square of the distance between them. But now let us say we do the following thought experiment, okay. So, physicists are very fond of doing thought experiments. So far what I was saying I could even demonstrate by throwing this ball up and down. This one I cannot demonstrate but let us imagine it anyway. So, imagine that there was some giant from an extraterrestrial civilization uh, who came and who pushed the sun a little bit, okay. So, the sun is there but maybe a giant comes and pushes the sun. Rahu, uh, Hanuman okay, Hanuman uh, okay good. So, Hanuman was trying to, uh, trying to reach the sun very good. So, maybe Hanuman was trying to jump up and Indra shot down Hanuman and so Hanuman uh, fell to the ground but uh, Indra shot down Hanuman right. But let us say Indra had not intervened in time and Hanuman had grabbed the sun and moved the sun right. So, now, now the question is, uh, what happens, uh, when will the earth know that you know Hanuman has actually taken the sun as a, as a plaything for himself, okay. So, so when, when, when will the, when will the, the, the earth know. So, if you, if you just take the Newtonian, the Newtonian force law seriously, the Newtonian force law tells you well the force between the earth and the sun is proportional to the product of the masses and inversely turned down. So, the distance has increased and because the distance has increased, uh, you would say that well the earth would know immediately right, because the distance between them has changed. Okay. And people realize that this is something which is kind of unusual because that about a hundred years ago it was realized that that is not the way physics works. Okay. Uh, in fact, people realize that information in physics, in physical systems never travels faster than the speed of light. And when you want to send a signal from one place to another place, then that signal can never be sent faster than the speed of light. So, this kind of feature where you have you know Hanuman or some giant grabbing the sun or uh, and, and then you know the, 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 the force that you feel changes instantaneously because you know there is some term in the formula that depends on the instantaneous distance between the objects. That kind of feature was realized to be unusual and it goes by the name of what is called sometimes non-locality, okay. This is a, a non-local feature in Newton's law in that. Newton's law is not something that tells you how two objects affect each other when they are right next to each other. It is something that tells you how two objects affect each other even when they are very far from each other. So, it makes reference to something like the instantaneous distance between two objects which is not a local quantity. It is not something that has to do with physics in one region but it is something that has to do with physics across a large branch of space. Okay. And that kind of feature was realized you know you can have such kind of non-locality. But if you do it, you have to be very careful because you know otherwise it would violate some other principle about 120 years ago which were that information does not travel faster than the speed of light. Is that well that is not how it happens, it is not that the sun and sun exerts a force in the earth, but rather that the sun and the earth both live 
in some fabric of space time. Okay? And what the sun does is not exert a force on the earth, but rather the sun bends the fabric of space time and the earth moves in this bent fabric of space time. And the way the earth moves in this bent fabric of space time, the earth basically in you know, all objects try to take the shortest possible trajectory between two points. But the natural shortest trajectories in this bent fabric of space time are not straight lines, but rather they are orbits around the sun. And that is the reason the earth orbits the sun. So you might see different words and this is such a completely different theory. And in fact, it is true that the ontology, you know what is sometimes said, the ontology of general relativity, which is the physical objects that it makes reference to. Introducing all these auxiliary things of a space-time fabric that extends everywhere. But in fact, the quantitative predictions of general relativity are often very, very close to that of Newtonian gravity. So the quantitative difference between general relativity and Newtonian gravity is very small. And in fact, to verify these theories required extraordinarily, exquisitely precise measurements of gravitational effects of, you know, the shift in the perihelion, very precise measurements. Okay? So there's a very small quantitative difference in many settings between these two theories, but the language that this theory of gravity uses is very different from the theory, from New the Newtonian theory. And this theory has the property of being a local theory. As I said, the Newtonian theory is non-local because, you know, it makes reference to how forces propagate across long distances. Okay? Here, this theory doesn't do that. This theory says the sun bends the fabric of space-time in its vicinity of where the sun is. And then, you know, the earth moves in whatever distance only affects things right next to it. So if you move the sun, it only affects something right next to it. But then that thing which is affected affects something here and the water here and here. So the way the eventually this thing starts bouncing is not because, because the propagation was local. There was a medium, which is exactly the same way things happen here. Yes, strict elliptical orbits. The, the, actually, this doesn't show whether the orbit is circular or not. This, just, this, is, a, this is my cartoon of ripple. So uh, just to be very clear, everything formulated is not by, so here what you're actually seeing is a curvature where the manifold, where this, this space has been, the curvature that actually enters in the general theory of relativity is an intrinsic curve. You don't have this external surface to see uh, going go outside the manifold and trying to embed, manifold is a fancy word, without going outside the space and trying to embed the space in a high plane and who had to measure whether the pla they were living on a plane or they were living on a large uh, surface of a sphere, they could do that by drawing a large triangle and then measuring the angles. Okay. So you're right that in these, I mean these cartoons, uh, so just to say once more, uh, these cartoons are, you know, have all of these inaccuracy. They don't show time. They show something being embedded in higher dimensions and so on. And to really see things accurately, you have to write down the equation. But this is meant to give you a picture of what is happening. I want to ask. A so if these ripples were to come, then, you know, if you imagine the earth going around, uh, these ripples would come and would push the earth around just the way ripples in water, like push a ship around when, it, when, it, when they cross the ship. So in exactly the same way. Now, this is actually a very, a very uh, uh, exaggerated prescription. But I don't know if you have heard of, you know, gravitational waves and the observation of gravitational waves, which is something that we've been doing now for about seven years. And in the observation of gravitational waves, we are in fact observing these ripples in space-time, okay? But the ripples in space-time are very weak. They don't, I mean, they do push the Earth, but huge interferometers by a distance which is smaller than that of an atom, okay? So to, to measure the ripples is extremely difficult, but they are ripples in space-time. And they do cause, you know, these big uh, apparatuses to, to bend and stretch. And, and that's indeed what we measure. So we have now measured these ripples in space time experimentally. One more question. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, like, uh, what is the, like, the nature of the, is it like uh, longitudinal or transversal? Well, <laughs> good. So, so, so these waves are, are also, are also they, you know, so, so gravitational waves are also transverse waves. Uh, we, we, I'll have to describe that in, in some more detail because the pole, you know, when you usually talk about longitudinal and transverse, you're talking about waves where, you know, the polarization here is described in terms of a tensorial field. Okay. So usually, you know, when you talk about these things, you have some wave and you have, you have some direction of propagation and you have some direction in which things oscillate. Okay. That, that's usually a situation where you have a vector. But there's some, one, one vector which describes how things propagate. Okay. Uh, in this situation, what describes something is not a vector, but like a product of two vectors. Okay? Uh, and indeed, that, that is also some, uh, something which is transverse. That polarization is also transverse. But it's a slightly more subtle concept, 
uh, than the concept you used to usually. Uh, so my question is actually related to the previous topic, okay. reversibility. So you said we are uh, hypothetic, uh, theoretically we can calculate uh, back in time and forward in time. But uh, however, if we take uncertainty into account, so is that really possible? Yeah, uh, so in a practical way. No, 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 not in practical. You mean Even quantum mechanically? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the we'll come, so why don't you hold your question till we come later? Yes, it okay. is possible. In quantum mechanics, also, uh, time evolution is completely reversible. So the including fact that there's including the probability factor, including okay. everything. So you know, the the fundamental equations of quantum mechanics also allow you to evolve forward in time and backward in time. So okay. uncertainty doesn't affect that. Okay. How far can the ripples move? Till the edge of the universe. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. So, so, so let, let's go on. Uh, very good. So now, now you know. Now we've learned all this about about grav It's true. They can really they they keep going forever. It's not a facetious answer. It's a serious answer. They they, they keep going forever. Okay. So so uh, and in fact, you know, the ripples that we observe come from very very far away. Like really, galaxies very very far away. So um, so you know, now that we've learned this about about gravity. You know, people learned the theory of gravity and it was discovered for all of these, you know, features. But once they learned the theory of gravity, they started asking, you know, once you form a theory, what you should do in physics is you should follow the theory where it leads you, right? You should start asking, what does the theory predict? And one of the things that people found is that the theory also predicts black holes, okay? It predicts some exotic objects which are, which are called black holes. And these black holes are regions, so this is a cartoon once again. Uh, and and the, the defining feature of a black hole, it's really the defining feature, is that there, there are regions from which not even light can escape. So if you're some observer here, then you can stay away from the black hole. But once you enter this region, so this region is called the horizon of the black hole. Once you're inside this black ring, this black region, then not even light can escape. And there is no way that one can escape from the black hole. Okay. So one way to relate it to the simple issues that we were discussing earlier is that a black hole is an object where the escape velocity has become the speed of light. Now that's not a completely accurate way to think about black holes because you know what escape velocity suggests is that you, know, you can still go very far away and come back. But in fact, once you've crossed this horizon, there's just no way to exit the horizon. Okay. So in fact, the way black holes work in general relativity is not exactly the way we talk about escape velocity, but you know, to zeroth order, you can think of black holes as objects where the escape velocity that we were talking about, that we we're talking about throwing objects up, launching them so that they would escape the gravitational field of the Earth, has now reached in, has now reached the speed of light, which is believed to be the ultimate speed beyond which it is not possible to go. Okay. Uh, you know, another way to say it is that the motion of time itself is such that something which is inside gets squeezed, okay, gets shrinks more and more. Okay, so this is just a prediction of the general theory of relativity. And you know, this, when this prediction was first made, it wasn't taken very seriously. This prediction was uh, first made uh, in, in, you know, now maybe 90 years ago. And uh, when people first talked about black holes, you know, people said, well, okay, you know, maybe this is some prediction, but it won't really ever happen. Okay. Now we now realize that that's not the case. And in fact, uh, many astronomical observations have been made of objects that behave like black holes. Now, of course, you can never exactly directly see a black hole, but of, of objects that behave, at least from the exterior, to all purposes, like black holes, including the initial gravitational wave observations that we were just discussing. These gravitational waves were formed when two such objects came and merged together, and the ripples that they set out in spacetime are so strong that you can measure them, even here, you know, in some galaxies very far away. Of course, it takes a lot of effort to measure them, but even then, these are remarkably energetic experiments that set about ripples that travel very far. Okay. So black holes are not just some theoretical objects that are predicted by the theory, uh, but they are things that you know, we have now seen in astronomical observations in many settings. Okay. How would a black hole form? So this black hole I showed you is just what happens at the end. Uh, so the way, you know, theorists like me, in fact, the actual formation of a black hole is, is a pretty complicated process, okay? And it's something that people spend a lot of time thinking about. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm a theorist and in fact, even amongst theorists, uh, the kind, kind of theory that we do is like uh, the theory of theory. And so, you know, we don't even worry about the complicated aspects of black hole formation. If you really ask, you know, how a black hole forms, 
uh, that's a complicated astrophysical process. The way I want you to think about how black holes form is, you know, you have a star and the star at some point was bright and giving out heat and light and bringing cheer to the world. And at some point, because all good things come to an end, uh, the star uh, ran out of fuel. And because it ran out of fuel, uh, eventually, you know, there's some gravitational pull that it never runs out of. And so uh, the gravitational pull forces the star to collapse more and more. And if it's strong enough, then the gravitational pull eventually forces the star to collapse into its own horizon. So remember previously I said black holes are marked by a horizon and it forces the star to collapse inside its own horizon which in this cartoon is depicted by this dashed line. And once the star is forced into its own horizon, then no force in the universe can stop it from collapsing further and so then it just collapses all the way down till it reaches the kind of picture that I showed you previously. Okay? So this is the kind of, kind of, kind of uh, process I want you to keep in mind. It's a very simplified process. You can think of this as a, a vanilla black hole, okay? It doesn't really exist in the universe where black holes are formed with all sorts of other violent things happening around them. Uh, but this is a, a sedate process of black hole formation that you should keep in mind. Okay, in fact- One second, sir. I would like to ask a question. Oh, come, yes. Yeah. Uh, from where? So, this side, this side. Ah, hi, yeah, yeah. So, I would like to know about the difference between the black hole and a wormhole. A black hole and a wormhole. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so um, a wormhole is used in many in many ways, uh, and it's often not used very very precisely. But roughly, I'll tell you the situation in which wormholes can be made very precise. Okay. It is sometimes you might have two black holes. Okay. So this black hole has. Let's go back to this picture. Now, this black hole has an entry point here. You wouldn't want to enter it, but there is an entry point for the black hole. Okay. It might so happen. You can write down solutions where there is also an entry point for the black hole in a very distant galaxy, it's very far away. Okay? And so somebody can jump into the black hole from that side and somebody can jump into this black hole from this side and, you will, and it turns out that inside they're connected together. Okay? So if you jump in from this side and the other person jumps in from a different galaxy, you might think that the other person is very far away, okay? but you still meet inside this black hole. Okay? So that is, that is uh, an example of a wormhole. A wormhole is roughly like a, a shortcut between two parts of space time. But the kinds of wormholes that, that you know you understand well are wormholes of this kind. Okay? Uh, there are other wormholes people talk about which are which are. Uh, excuse uh, me, sir. Uh, yeah, just just a second, please. Can I just complete? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So so these so you know that those are the wormholes that we we understand best. Okay. So if you are separated, yeah, just if you separated from your long lost friend who had gone to a different galaxy, you thought there was never a chance of meeting them. If you found a wormhole like, and they found a wormhole, you could jump and meet the friend. Of course, then both of you would come to a an unfortunate end because you'd both be crushed by the black hole, but before that you could at least meet. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, are the, uh, these stars the only like planet, this uh, planetary objects or like astronomical objects that become a black hole? Or like, uh, are there like uh, other these uh, astronomical objects that can like convert into a black hole? Like if we like uh, keep the mass the same yeah. and like uh, reduce the like radius of it so that like it's very dense uh, like in the center. So does that means like any uh, like astronomical object can become a black hole? In principle, anything can become a black hole. But you know, the point is that in the black holes that we observe in the universe are black holes that were formed from the collapse of big stars. But if you compress the earth enough, you could make it a black hole. The, you'd need to compress the entire earth to a radius of one centimeter, to about this much. If you took the whole earth and you compressed it to this radius, it would become a black hole. Okay? So anything can become a black hole, all, almost any mass, about some limit that's very small. Uh, can become uh, compared to our, our sizes, like you and I can become black holes. But the forces that are required to create these black holes, the way they occur in nature, are often with large stars. But we, you know, perhaps at the beginning of the universe or in other situations, uh, much smaller black holes were formed. The black holes that we've observed right now are much larger black holes, which have to do with stellar black holes. I, I'll say a little bit more about this later. Thanks. Okay, good. So uh, this is an example, uh, the same diagram that I showed you. You know, you, usually we don't like to draw cartoons. I showed you this cartoon of a black hole formation, right? So the way physicists usually draw this is by what's called a space-time diagram, where time goes on the y-axis and this is space. Okay? Uh, so this is the same cartoon. It's exactly the same figure I showed you previously. Here is the star, which became like, you know, a dead star. It got tired of life and, and then eventually it starts collapsing. And this is the horizon that I showed you. Okay, so this is the dashed line. And uh, uh, this, this, this uh, uh, process uh, was first described in detail by Oppenheimer and Schneider and a little earlier by a, a, 
a Bengali physicist called B. Dutt, about whom actually very little is known, but who did some pretty important work a couple of years before Oppenheimer and Schneider. And then there were much simpler models of this that were developed by an Indian physicist called P. C. Vaidya and A. K. Rai Chaudhary, who was also, you know, made fundamental contributions in understanding uh, these kinds of processes. So Indian physicists uh, made a lot of uh, uh, contributions in understanding uh, this process of uh, black hole formation. Okay. okay, so this is the same diagram and this is the process that I'd like you to keep in mind. I'm going to show you one last, one last uh, quirk on this diagram. It's not important, uh, but uh, just for those who are interested. You know, often the diagrams that you'll see, and I'll, I'll have maybe one or two more in this talk, are, uh, you know, in this diagram, it's hard to see why light can't escape. You know, it is true that light can't escape from here. Uh, this is a diagram where I have rescaled x and y. So I've changed the y axis. Right? I can do that. I can always take, choose units so the y axis has different units, x axis has different units. And physicists often like to do that so that all light rays are 45 degree lines. Remember time is going on the y axis and space is going on the x axis. And you rescale things so that light rays are 45 degree lines. And here you see the black hole horizon is what's called a 45, is, is a 45 degree line. So it is a ray of light. If you had a ray of light that was trying to expand outwards that was living on the horizon, it would never make it outside the horizon, but it would just live on the horizon, okay. And there is a last ray, a ray that just escapes, which is a ray just outside this, and everything inside this can never escape the black hole and ends up in this region called the singularity, okay. This kind of diagram is called the Penrose diagram after the British physicist Roger Penrose. Okay, good. So now, uh, you know, uh, we've discussed some aspects of this. Uh, so, you know, I started this talk by discussing mundane physics, what we might call mundane physics, which is just a physics, I mean, mundane is not meant to be a pejorative word, it's just a, the physics of everyday objects and balls and gravity and uh, as we have understood it for many years. And then I said, well, you know, uh, you had to correct that when you started going to strong gravitational fields and you came to the theory of general relativity, which predicted also black holes. Okay? Now, to talk about uh, these issues of uh, quantum gravity and paradoxes about black holes, I have to take you in another direction and I have to tell you a little bit about quantum mechanics, okay. So I'm now going to, uh, uh, we've done this and this and now I'm going to talk a little bit about quantum mechanics. Okay. Yes. Correct. That's the defining feature of a black hole. Yes. Yes. That yes, means, uh, the black hole should have gobbled up all the light in the universe now. Well, no, not all the light in the universe has had a chance to fall in the black hole, right? Okay. So if, if I have something here that's absorbing all light, it doesn't mean everything will go off. Okay, the light that falls in will get absorbed. And but the other things outside which are outside the black hole, which are producing light. Black hole is black. That's why it's called black hole, is it? Like, well, okay, a uh, black hole is, is uh, actually the name is, I don't, I don't actually know the etymology of the name. It comes in many complicated ways. Uh, what the etymology of the name was and it used to be called frozen star in Russian and black hole and so um, uh, it's true a black hole is black. So that it, that's one reason for the name. Uh, but the history of the name is, is more interesting. I don't know about it. You have a question? Yes. Black hole doesn't stop it from coming out but the point is if you try to go out you still fall in. See unless you go at the speed of light you will still fall in. But if, if we go at the speed of light? If you go at the speed of light and you're at the horizon, exactly at the horizon, then you'll stay there. But once you're inside the horizon, even if you go at the speed of light, you will still fall in. But how will we, uh, how will the black hole stop us from going out? The black hole doesn't stop you. It's just that the space around you is contracting so fast that you're trying to run out, but you can't run out before the space collapses. So it's not that the black hole is actually stopping you. You can keep trying to run, but even before you reach outside, the space around is collapsed. Imagine this room starts collapsing very, very, very fast. So you're trying to run out, but before you can reach outside, the room has collapsed. Okay. So if you if you started earlier, maybe you would have escaped before the room collapsed. So that's one way to think about the black hole. You know, the room is collapsing, and however fast you run, you can't make it out before the room collapses. Once you're inside, if you're at the edge, then you can. So, so yes. Hello. Yeah, go. On. Yes. Correct. Doesn't have that escape velocity. Correct. But in a previous equation, the Newton's equation, we saw that uh, for gravity to work, it needs m1 and m2 to be non-zero. 
So Th there is a mass at the center of the black hole. Uh, yeah, but light doesn't have any mass. Uh, oh, uh, light so does have mass actually. It does respond to. So good. So uh, th the the picture you're talking about is Newtonian gravity, but in fact light does respond to gravity waves. Light is not immune to gravity. And you can see that in many situations. One of the ways you see that in astronomy is by means of what's called gravitational lensing. So remember in the in the modern theory of gravity we don't talk about forces between objects. We say the black hole bends space time and everything else moves in that bend space time. Everything else includes light. So light that is propagating must also propagate in the same fabric of space time that everything else propagates in. So it's not that light sees so, a different. So space. even if the mass is zero it can still be affected by gravity. Absolutely. So whatever the mass is, if you have a small object, you know, a, a probe object, even if that mass, whether that is light or something else, it will all be seeing the same fabric of space time. It will also be affected by gravity. Thank so you. nothing is immune from gravity. In fact, that's one of, you can think of as, a, it is one of the predictions of general relativity, is that nothing is immune from gravity. You know, things are immune from other forces. If you're not charged, you're immune from the electromagnetic force. There are things which are not charged, which don't feel electromagnetic forces. But everything feels a gravitational force, including light. So, yeah. So, to what extent does the collapse occur? To what extent does the? To what extent does the co collapse occur in black hole? Like, does it go on the collapse? Uh, the collapse goes on. So, this, this picture will tell you that. You know, there, the collapse goes on and then everything, these things collapses to a singularity. So, it just collapses. You know, eventually it might be that we don't understand the physics of that. At some point when these things become very small, some new physics takes over which is not general relativity and the collapse stops. But within the theory of general relativity, it collapses all the way to a singularity. This is called a singularity. Now, it is believed that usually the singularity will not really form. It will it'll, it'll get corrected by some other physics, but we don't understand that well. Yeah. Yes. Go on. Yeah, okay. Well, I don't mind. Whoever. <laughs> you can go on. Uh, what's exactly the nature of the singularity at the center of the black hole? We don't, we don't understand the singularity at the center of the black hole uh, very well. Uh, the singularity is, is some, is some uh, I mean, it's some region where tidal forces become very large, but uh, you know, uh, we don't have a very good understanding of what happens exactly at the singularity. That's a limited, I mean, that's just something that modern physics doesn't yet understand. information that the object is carrying. We'll talk about that. And what about the clone theory? Uh, if we, we we'll talk about that. Okay. So hold your question, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. When the star collapses, the event horizon increases at first, expands. Uh, when the, good, so, so the event horizon, the reason it's starting this way is if you're an observer here, you can actually escape before the star collapses, okay. Now, this is the final extent of the event horizon. But if you were here, then you see you could have, let's say you were here, right? So you're inside the star. You could still have escaped. If you continue to live with the star, you would collapse. But if you're here, you could have escaped. I, I don't know if I'm drawing, if you're here, outside the horizon. If you're inside the horizon, let's say I tried to escape. But before I escape, the star will collapse around me and prevent me from escaping. It's like what I was describing. Okay? So. Uh, so it's just one question. I don't know, how do we do on time? Actually, I don't mind taking questions forever, but I don't know how we are, uh, I mean, uh, are we strict about time or <laughs> how, yeah. Okay, uh, is, that's half an hour is a strict limit or? Okay, <laughs> fine, okay, good. So, so go on, yeah, yeah. Go so, on, yeah, there's a question, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sir. Yeah, no, I don't know. Do who. spinning black holes, oh, uh, Seth, do yeah. spinning black holes have any other effects? Like how can we describe the effects of spinning black holes? Ma many effects, I mean, you know, spinning black holes create this effect called frame drag. Once you start moving, you have to spin around with them. So, in fact, most black holes that we observe in the universe are spinning black holes. They're not of this kind, which don't spin. This is an example of what's called a Schwarzschild black hole, which is a very simple black hole. That's why I said it was a vanilla black hole. Most black holes are what are called Kerr black holes, so they spin. And you see that in, in many effects they have around them, in the accretion disk and so on. That's an astrophysical question, and for the purposes of this talk, those differences are not important. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. So, you talked about the horizon and you talked about the singularity. So, at what point uh, do we stop calling it the horizon and at what point the singularity starts? They're separated regions. So everything that I'm going to talk about further in this talk is going to be about the horizon and not about the singularity, which as I said, we don't understand very well. So the horizon is the region once you cross, you can never get back. The singularity is the region where, you know, tidal forces become infinite and nothing survives at all. 
know, you can actually survive if you cross beyond the horizon. Like if you're here, you have some time. You know, it's not like you'll get immediately destroyed. It's true you can never escape to infinity, but it's not like you'll immediately get destroyed. Okay? Maybe on this diagram it's clearer. You know, there's a, this is the horizon and this is the singularity. If you're here, then you know, if you're a ray of light, you can kind of extend your life. And if you have a big, big, big black hole, then that, that lifespan can be, much, can be pretty long. Right? So sometimes people say we could be crossing a black hole horizon right now, and it's true. Like we could have at this instant entered a black hole horizon, and we wouldn't even know it, like if the black hole was large enough. It's true that our eventual fates would be sealed, but we wouldn't necessarily even know it. So the horizon is not a place which is locally violent. It's not a place which, it's a place which has to do with the fact that you can never escape back to infinity. But it's not that it's an immediately violent area. The singularity is like a, a locally violent area. And I won't say much about the singularity in this talk. Okay, good. So now let me go on to this other branch, which is the issue of quantum mechanics, okay? Because that's the other thing I promised to talk about. Good. So now, uh, you see there are many, many things one can say about quantum mechanics. I, I, want, I want to say some very simple things about quantum mechanics, okay, which have to do with the question of uncertainty that was brought about, okay. So here's, here is, here is uh, the thing that I hope everyone knows about quantum mechanics, even appears in newspaper articles nowadays, which is what's called Schrodinger's cat, okay. And the thing I want you to, to know, you have a question? Yes. What happens after three years of the Then that we do not know. So it is not known in physics what happens once uh, an object reaches a singularity. What is known is that local forces become very violent, but we do not yet understand how that is corrected and what happens once you really reach the singularity. Okay, so, uh, okay, so going back to quantum mechanics, so what do I want to say? So I, here are some basic things I want, I want us to be on the same page about quantum mechanics, okay? So, you know, the relativity and gravity, this modifies our notions of space and time, which we discussed at some length. What quantum mechanics does in fact is even more radical. Okay, quantum mechanics modifies our mundane notions of reality. In that, we sometimes say that this is in my right hand, right? Or it's in my left hand. It's either here or it's here. Now, in quantum mechanics, it turns out that objects do not have to have a, a definite, or observables do not have to have a definite value like we usually believe they do. And this indefiniteness is not just a question of ignorance. You see, if I were to hold the pointer here, I ask you, is it my right hand or my left hand? You don't know, right? Except for those people who can see around my back. So the people at the back don't know whether it's in my right hand or my left hand. But it is in my right hand. I know it's in my right hand. Okay, that's the fact. Or, and now it is in my left hand, even though you can't make out. But in quantum mechanics, our mundane notions of reality are changed in that you can really have a situation where the pointer is neither in my left hand nor in my right hand. And the fundamental description of reality that we have is necessarily probabilistic. Okay? So the cartoon picture that's often used to show this is the picture of Schrodinger's cat. For those of you who haven't heard the story, the story of Schrodinger's cat is that, you know, you have a cat which is in a box and there is a radioactive atom which is going to decay, okay. Uh, when the radioactive atom decays, if the atom decays, it releases mice, mice is methyl isocyanate. And by releasing mice, the cat dies, okay? On the other hand, if the atom doesn't decay, then you don't release mice, and if you don't release mice, then the cat lives, okay? Now the atom might have a probability half of decaying or not decaying in some time, and then uh, you are left with a situation where the cat, logically, is in a situation of being with probability half dead and probability half alive. But the important thing is it's not that you're ignorant about the cat being alive or dead. It is the fact that the cat is genuinely in such a superposition, okay? So that's, that's, that's something which is, which is a complicated concept to understand. And in fact, with cats, it's very hard to produce such Schrodinger cat states. But we do produce such states in a in much simpler setup. So if you, all of you who've read about quantum computing and quantum mechanics, uh, know that if you take much simpler settings, like, you know, uh, electrons or, or other, other systems that have two possible states, uh, such systems are called qubits, okay? They're called qubits for quantum bits just because the way bits in computers have two states, zero and one. Uh, these quantum mechanical systems can also have two states. Let's call them up and down. And so this system can either be up or down, but in fact, exactly like the Schrodinger scat, and this is something we can really do in experiments. We know how to do this. You can prepare these systems in a superposition of being up and down. And what superposition means, okay? is that when you measure it with probability half, you'll find it up, 
and with probability half you will find it down. But the real description of reality is that it is in a state which is up plus down. Operationally, experimentally it means if you measure it you will find it up half and down half. But it is not like it is really either in a half, either in up half or in down half. Okay. Really it is in the state which is a superposition of up plus down. Okay. So that is something which is, it is just a fact, it is something that we learned. It is something that caused a lot of people, a lot of discomfort including Einstein uh, who did not accept quantum mechanics uh, till the end of his life because he could not reconcile himself with this feature. But it is a feature that we have now tested in many, many, many experiments and this is really how the world seems to work as best as we can tell. Now this is one feature of quantum mechanics which is how it affects our notions of reality. But there is something else which is even stranger okay. And this sometimes is what uh, in newspapers uh, you will uh, read off as referred to as you know uh, spooky action at a distance okay. Uh, which really has to do with a feature in quantum mechanics called entanglement. Okay. And that is really the following feature and I will tell you why it is important in a second. Which is you know take two of these identical qubits. Remember I said which are systems which can be either up or down. So now you have two of them right. So both can be up, 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 down or they can be down, up or down, down right. You have two systems. So if you had two bits, I was counting in binary, I could have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, four states right. But now you can try and superpose these states. So you can think of the following system. It is called an Einstein Podolsky Rosen state after because this was one of the paradoxes that Einstein created to prove quantum mechanics was wrong. Okay. But it is an interesting state, it is quantum mechanics is not wrong. Uh, but uh, it is it's an interesting state and it is the following state. Okay. Which is where I took this system which was up and down and I added to it this system which was down and up. So remember in quantum mechanics you are allowed to add states. And what that means is if you measure this whole system you will find that you know uh, it is with probability half in this state or with probability half in this state. In fact you can do something a little funny with these systems. You, these systems could be electrons or they could be something else that has two states. You can take them and you can separate them physically right once you created them in this correlated state. So here were these two bits, these two qubits and here were two experimenters who created them uh, in uh, uh, and you know one of the experimenters let us call them Ali and Bindu. Okay, so Ali and Bindu, Ali stayed in earth and Bindu went off to Mars. Uh, and now uh, you know uh, they have, they, they took one of these electrons and Ali put this electron in his pocket, Bindu put this in her pocket, they went off here. And now Ali can measure the electron that Ali has, okay. And Ali measures the electron with probability half Ali will find this electron is up. With probability half Ali will find this electron is down. Similarly Bindu will find this electron is, is up and down with probability half. But what is important is that their answers will be correlated. The reason their answers will be correlated is because the initial state was prepared as being a superposition of up down plus down up. So if you measure this to be up then this is necessarily down. And if you measure this to be down this is necessarily up. Okay. So the phenomena I want you to keep in mind here, I, we do not want to go into all the intricacies of this issue is that neither of the system is in a definite state but the measurements that Ali and Bindu make are correlated. Okay. So both observations have fluctuations. You can think of them as quantum mechanical fluctuations in that if you took many of these systems like a million of these systems okay, and Ali started measuring all these million systems one by one and Bindu started measuring all her systems one by one. Then you know on half a million Ali would find up and on half a million for those same half a million Bindu would find down and on half a million Ali would find down and on these half a million Bindu would find up. And so you know these answers would be just randomly distributed, they would be just, uh, they would be fluctuations. But these fluctuations are correlated. So quantum mechanics leads to a situation where you have uncertainty, the uncertainty leads to fluctuations and it can also happen that the fluctuations are correlated. Now the reason this is important for the story that I am about to tell is that the vacuum itself, okay, the, the space, the, the fundamental you know nature of, of the space time that we live in, in quantum mechanics does have such fluctuations. Okay. So you might think that nothing is happening here, right. I mean I am speaking but there is some air in the middle. And you might think well you know 
uh, let me look at it with a fine microscope and I'll find some atoms which are moving about. And then in the middle of those atoms, there's a lot of empty space. And we tend to think of this vacuum, this empty space as being a region where nothing is happening. But in fact, when you apply quantum mechanics and when you consistently apply quantum mechanics to space time, you find something very interesting which is that the, this is a cartoon of course, which is that this vacuum itself is actually not something which is just, just sitting there. Rather this vacuum itself has such quantum fluctuations in that if you make a measurement in the vacuum, it's not necessary that all measurements, even measurements of energy will give you zero. Sometimes if you make a measurement of energy even in the vacuum, you will find an answer that's non-zero and that non-zero answer will be correlated to the, the non-zero answer that you would make for a measurement of an energy nearby. Okay? So just like in other qubit systems, I described you have quantum fluctuations and those fluctuations are correlated. We now know that the vacuum itself that we live in and all, everything around us has such quantum fluctuations and these fluctuations are correlated. So in particular, just to emphasize again, the energy which you would think there is none of in the vacuum, it's not true. Okay, if you were to make a measurement of energy in the vacuum and make a measurement of energy somewhere close by, you would find a non-zero answer. You would find fluctuations in the energy you measure at one point and the energy that you measure at the other point and these fluctuations would be correlated precisely the way that we discussed in this toy example of Ali and Bindu who had two electrons in their hand, okay. So that's an important thing that I'd like you to keep in mind about quantum mechanics. Uh, yeah, you have a question, yeah. No, 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 you cannot. Uh, there is, you, you, you'd never violate the law of the principle of conservation of energy. Okay. So if you would, no, that's not infinite source of energy, the infinite fluctuations. The total energy, the, uh, so you know, uh, you, have to, you have to differentiate between fluctuations and between having infinite energy. Even in this situation, you can never actually create angular momentum. You might have thought I could create many things with spin up, but that's not true. When you find spin up here, you find spin down here. When you find spin down here, you find spin up here. So it's not that you, you, can, you can use this foam to extract an infinite amount of energy. The energy of the world is conserved, okay? but it's true there are fluctuations. So yeah. if there is nobody in the vacuum, but who are we missing? Like, Who are we missing? No, the, the fundamental nature of the vacuum is not said it. The vacuum is, is like, you know, it's like saying that you think you're in a sea, but in fact the sea is not, not a sedate sea. There's some frothing and churning that's happening that's very hard to see. It requires accurate measurements. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, that's, it's, it's, a, it's a feature of the world that we live in. Uh, uh, can we use these correlations? I mean, uh, suppose there are two electrons and like I do a measurement of one electron and it has some implication on the measurement of other electron. So is the, are the consequences of measurement of one on another uh, immediate? Like I measure here and immediately the effect is seen on the other. It is not that there's an effect of one and the other. In fact, this was the error that Einstein made and that was the reason this, it was, you know, they were thinking in terms of you measure one and there's an effect on the other. No, that's not the case. But it's true that, you know, you measure one, you measure the other and immediate, you will always find correlations. So you could measure one and immediately measure the other. You know, even immediately is not well defined over spatial distances uh, because, you know, time is relative and so on. But it's true, you could have some clock, you could synchronize your clocks and say, I'll measure one, you measure the other at the same time. And uh, indeed, you would always find correlated answers instantaneously. So, uh, like, it's can we uh, use that to transmit information faster than light? No, you cannot. And this was, in fact, the basis of this paradox. So, the reason Einstein set up this paradox was to say, look, you would, you could have used this to transmit information faster than the speed of light, and you can't. I can't go into details, but let me tell you roughly why. The reason you can't is, you know, let's say you measured up here. Okay? The point is that, so now. Bindu is, uh, is the one in Mars and, and whether you measured up or didn't measure down, the probability for Bindu to measure down or up is always half. You can do nothing in, on earth to change the probability for Bindu to measure up or down. The way you could transmit information is if you created million such pairs and Bindu took million to Mars, you kept million with you on earth and you somehow had a way of changing the probability distribution that Bindu would see. 
if you had some way of making it so that 60% of the ones that she would see would be up and 40% would be down, or the 30% would be up and 70% would be down, then you could transmit information. But Ali has no control over the results of the measurements that Ali gets on this side, right? So Ali gets half with probability half, and uh, up with probability half, and down with probability half. And so therefore, Bindu also sees up with probability half and down with probability half. So for them to actually transmit information and see this correlation, Ali would have to phone Bindu and tell them what the answer was. But that phoning would require the speed of light. Okay, that's the reason you can't transmit information faster than the speed of light. So like, uh, out of a million, I will get half of them are up and half of them are down. But I don't know exactly which I'll get up and down. Correct. That's right. So you can't use it to transmit information faster than that. How are they practically entangled? Uh, in many different ways, I mean, uh, you can create, uh, it depends on what kind of experimental setup you use. But you know, uh, you, to entangle things, you always get them close by, and you prepare an initial state which is entangled, and you can do that in many different systems. I mean, there are many ways of realizing things. <laughs> One thing that, you know, I, I don't ever do experiments, but when I was an undergraduate student, I worked on NMR systems. When you have these, these, these big nuclei, you can create these setups where you, know, you, you entangle Various uh, things, various pins in the nuclei. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. So here. Yeah. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. Sir, uh, the space time is S three, right? Is S three? There's no S three here. No S three space. space uh, one three plus one. The, that's not called S three, but maybe you mean. But go on. Uh, okay. Go on. What's my, your question? Yeah. Uh, my question was, if we cannot access the four dimension on a day-to-day -day basis, how can we understand four dimension using a three D object? like collapse of, like entering a black hole or anything like that? Well, uh, so this is going back to the previous part of the talk, but the way, you know, you, you see the fourth dimension is, the fourth dimension is just time. So the way, you know, we pictureize this is by saying that you have three spatial dimensions and one time dimension. Uh, if you like, you can keep them separate. It just so happens that the description that you get from relativity is such that it's natural to treat them on the same footing. And to think of a manifold, that's not S3, you sometimes call this manifold R31, which is one time duration. <laughs> Directions. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, is whole of the quantum me mechanics also a relativistic phenomenon? Is what? Is whole of the quantum mechanics also a relativistic phenomenon? No, no. Quantum mechanics is not fundamentally relativistic. So, quantum mechanics you can formulate in a non relativistic way, but quantum mechanics turns out to be completely consistent with relativity. So, so relativi you can have relativistic systems, you can describe them in quantum mechanics. You don't need to change quantum mechanics to account for relativity. But quantum mechanics works perfectly well for non-relativistic systems. That's how you usually learn it in all undergraduate courses. Yeah. Uh, actually, he performed the experiment in which uh, quantum information was trans, you know, transferred across spaces. And uh, that, what you said, that can, quantum information cannot be transported between two points actually is broken at that point, right? Because... Uh, Oh, yeah. It's not that quantum information can't be transmitted. It can be transmitted, but not faster than the speed of light. You know, when you talk about quantum communication or oh. quantum teleportation, you do transmit information, but it always goes slower than the speed of light. You can't use this phenomena to communicate faster than the speed of light. Uh, um, maybe I'm wrong and my, my knowledge is very less, but still the thing that I read about uh, described that uh, two entangled quantum states were created simultaneously across the labs and the states were measured simultaneously and this information was passed about what state was measured. Yeah. That's In, a, yeah. Go so, on. Uh, and uh, the information that reached there uh, correctly showed the correlation between the results that were observed in both labs. Exactly as here. Even before the information was, you know. E exactly as here. You see, this is the question that was asked earlier. And sometimes, this is, this is something which uh, sometimes is described very poorly in the, uh, you know, in the, uh, uh, in, the uh, in the popular media, okay. But, uh, th this thing that you're talking about, which is this CHSH inequality, you know, this whole issue of, it's precisely about these correlations, okay. So, if the person measures something on Earth, and the person measures something on Mars, we can synchronize our clocks. We can decide when at 12 o'clock on January 15th, we will make this measurement, exactly. They will, if this person finds up, this person will necessarily always find down. E, so you might think that that somehow information was being transmitted faster than the speed of light. But in fact, no information is transmitted. You can't actually use this to send a message from Ali to Bindu. It's true that you make the, in, you make the measurements at the same time, exactly the same time. Okay? And you will find that this is up and this is down. 
it's, you don't have to wait for like light to travel from Earth to Mars. But it's important to realize this is happening because of the fundamental underlying property of the state. It is not because, you know, somehow something is being communicated from here to here. It's not like this electron told this electron, I was up, so you be down. It's just the fundamental property of the state is such that these correlations already exist. So if you measure it and you find this up, you find this down. You don't have to wait for light to be transmitted. So if it is a fundamental property, there yes. is one more thing that we discussed that is hidden variables. And it was ruled out because we couldn't find uh, something of that sort, hidden variables. Correct. So if it is an intrinsic property, that would actually direct to the concept of... No. So hidden variables were described, in fact, to get a more, you know, were, dis were designed by people who are uncomfortable with this notion of, uh, you know, this kind of transmission. In fact, this whole idea, this thing that you're talking about, about the Nobel Prize that was given, was given for some things called Bell's inequalities. Bell's inequalities were developed to rule out local hidden variables. Okay? So there was this theory by David Bohm that said, you know, that it, it actually came before that. It came from the idea, you know, earlier I said Schrodinger's cat was up or down. The theory of hidden variables says that maybe there is a more fundamental underlying reality which you don't have access to and the cat is really alive or is really dead. So it's like what I was saying here. Right? My point is either really in my right hand or really in my left hand. So there is a hidden variable here. It's hidden from you guys, right? You don't know which one it is. But there it's, it has some definite value. This pointer is not in a quantum superposition. So David Bohm and others tried to construct a theory of hidden variables which was, would replace quantum mechanics by introducing hidden variables. In fact, the whole insight of Bell and others and CHSH and, uh, you know, uh, uh, all of these people was to try and you know, show that you can't have local hidden variable theories that will have the same properties as quantum mechanics. You can have non-local hidden variable theories, but okay, you know, those are also hard to make consistent with relativity and so on. So they're not a subject of active research. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yeah. So you, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but you just now said uh, that quantum mechanics uh, sit well with relativity. So isn't there a contradiction while talking about the black hole information paradox? Good, good. I'll come to that if we, if we come to that. Good. Uh, that that's the point of the talk. So, so I, I, that's the next part. Yes. I have a question on yes. quantum fluctuations. I'm here. Ah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So in the so right now in these entanglements, we basically have some electrons or something yes, yes. that's holding a quantum chain that's fluctuating. But then when you when we talk about vacuum, what exactly the physical system that's assuming these quantum states, which then fluctuates? Is the nature of space time. For instance, you could measure the energy in the vacuum. You could have a, that's that's a concrete observable that fluctuates. The energy fluctuates. You could say is the energy the energy can even be negative locally for a short amount of time. So you might measure energy, you might think it's something positive, but in the quantum theory it's not in in a local region. You can ask how much energy is here and how much energy is here in the vacuum, and that observable would fluctuate. Okay, and what is the physical system? Then is space time itself. Space time itself. Okay. Yes, go. Ahead. You said that um, uh, bla the black hole is a, a tunnel between uh, the uh, a shortcut between space time. Then, uh, if we uh, put something on one side and uh, it comes out on the other, uh, it will uh, be transmitted faster than that. Exactly, that is what's called a tra traversable wormhole. But a black hole, you can't come out on the other side. You can only go in from both sides. That's how it's consistent with relativity. There are these examples of wormholes that you read of in science fiction, which indeed you can come in from one side and go out from the other side, and that would allow you to go faster than the speed of light. And that would be inconsistent with relativity. But black hole is a shortcut, but you can only go in, you can't come out. So you can go in from this side and go in from this side, but you can't come out from the other side. That's how it's consistent. Excuse me, sir. It's a one way uh, wormhole, yeah. It's oh. not traversable, so you can't. So these wormholes are called non-traversable wormholes, exactly for this reason. Uh, sir. I don't see where you. Huh. What are the factors that are affecting this quantum fluctuations? Is there any factors? There are intrinsic fluctuations of the state. So the vacuum itself has intrinsic fluctuations. The, you okay, know, so the, like it is not same everywhere, right? So it will be changing. Uh, if the vacuum itself would have a same spectrum of fluctuations, indeed, you know, it could be changing. But, you know, these fluctuations you see. For instance, you look at the cosmic microwave background. The cosmic microwave background does have such fluctuations. Okay. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll go on to the black hole information paradox since that was something. So let, let me just, uh, and then we'll take questions again a little bit at the end, unless there are very urgent questions uh, because there are some people who might need to go and I'm happy to stay on forever, but let's, let's, uh, uh, let, let's go on to, to this. Okay, great. So, so now we discussed mundane physics and general relativity and quantum mechanics and now I'm going to try and tell you what happens if you try and 
put these things together, okay, and how you get some paradoxes and what we understand, what we have understood recently about how you resolve those paradoxes. Okay, okay so remember what I said, I emphasize the issue here of reversibility of time evolution. I told you about black holes and I told you about quantum fluctuations, okay, so if you've been sleeping so far, these are the three things you should remember. Okay, okay good. So, so now, you know, Hawking was one of the first few people, Stephen Hawking, the British physicist, to apply the principles of quantum mechanics to black holes, okay? And he found the following phenomena, which I'll explain in words, okay? He found that here is, here is our black hole, and remember I said there were fluctuations, right, including in the vacuum. Now, here is a black hole, and this is the black hole horizon, and this region, in fact, is the vacuum. Remember, this is that, that Penrose diagram I showed you, so it's like saying uh, there's a black hole which collapsed, Right? And after it collapsed, it left, there was some star which collapsed, there's nothing left, the star has collapsed. We are behind the horizon, but the star has already collapsed. So there's nothing where we are, right? I said earlier also that the horizon is not locally a violent place. But Hawking found that, well, it's not locally a violent place, so in fact, locally it looks like the vacuum looks elsewhere. And therefore, this region also has fluctuations, as we were just discussing. But he found that when you apply this, you find something funny. Imagine that you have fluctuations which create particles. Fluctuations can create particles. Remember I said you can measure energy. Sometimes you can have fluctuations which create particles spontaneously after some time those particles and antiparticles then highlight. Imagine, this is a rare process but it can happen. Imagine that you formed a particle here and an antiparticle at that side. So these are fluctuations that as I said have to be correlated. You form a particle here, you form some other particle on the other side. But then, these are on opposite sides of the horizon, because I'm thinking of the vacuum region just next to the horizon, so I've zoomed in here. And Hawking said, well, you know, what would happen is that this particle is outside the horizon, whereas this one is inside the horizon. So this one which is outside the horizon would escape out, you know, or could escape out, maybe it would fall in, but it could escape out to infinity, whereas this one which is inside the horizon can never escape out. So if you think about that process, this is called spontaneous pair creation. If you're an observer just sitting outside the black hole, it would look to you that there's some stream of particles which is emerging. Due to these vacuum fluctuations, usually what happens is you have particles, antiparticles, they're created in the vacuum, but I don't see a stream of particles emerging because the particles, antiparticles, and high late, right? But here, because they're formed on opposite sides of the horizon, they don't have that chance, and so once they're formed, the particles that are formed come out, and the other side, other ones go in, they're separated necessarily by gravity and the other ones go and form, fall into the black hole. So this is what is called Hawking radiation. It's a very weak effect because, you know, these quantum fluctuations are very small. That's why we don't see them all the time. But nevertheless, it's an effect that does exist and does emerge if you consistently apply the principles of quantum mechanics to black holes. Okay? So Hawking found that when you applied the principles of quantum mechanics to black holes, the picture that you had of a black hole would be modified. This is a highly exaggerated picture, but remember earlier I said there was a horizon and there was some black region here. But now Hawking said, well, about this horizon you would actually form, it would be like there was some fire there, you know, as if you were seeing a steady stream of particles that were coming out. So in quantum mechanics, a black hole is not exactly black. It emits some particles okay, with some steady rate, with some temperature. So it's really like a hot object elsewhere, which emits some radiation. Okay? And what is more, and, and this is coming just from the things that we discussed, from quantum fluctuations, from the fact that you have a black hole, from the fact that things can't cross the horizon of the black hole. And Hawking found that, was able to in fact compute the spectrum of these fluctuations. And he found that the spectrum obeyed some, some uh, curve, and that curve, for those of you who, who study this, is called the Planck black body curve. For those of you who haven't studied it, basically what Hawking found is that a black hole emits exactly the same way as an ordinary black body does, okay? If you take a black body and you heat it, it will emit radiation in some way, and the black hole is emitting exactly the same way that a black body does. In fact, a black hole is a perfect black body. So it's a, it's a very perfect black body. And he was able to calculate the temperature of a black hole. So the black hole of a certain mass M will emit with a temperature which is proportional to, inversely proportional to M and proportional to a lot of these other constants, okay? And he was, so in, in more human units, this is 10 to the minus 8 Kelvin for 
a black hole of the mass of the sun. So, it is very small for those of you who know how much that is. And if you take a much larger black hole, it is even smaller. So, it is inversely proportional. Quick question, yes, very quick question. What if something is half inside the hull and half outside? No, the thing that is inside the horizon will fall in. So, you cannot, that is not a stable situation, which is exactly what Hawking used. You see, this is, you might have thought this pair is half inside and half outside, but that is not a stable situation because something cannot keep hovering just inside the horizon, it has to fall in. And that is why those, those forces, those particles necessarily get separated. So, that, that situation where something is half inside and half outside does not work. The thing which is outside can stay outside if it works hard enough, the thing which is inside falls what inside. If it's what if it is a quark? What if it is a quark? A quark is a point particle, so it cannot quite be inside or outside. Uh, but uh, we will, uh, so it is, so you know you have to think of a quark uh, in a more detailed way. Uh, but indeed if you think of you know a quark which is, which is spread out a little bit then the wave function will have to evolve in that way. But a quark is really a point particle, so it can't be like that. The simplest way to think about it is to think of two particles. You can think of a, of a quark which is slightly spread out, but it would behave the same way. You basically cannot have a situation where you maintain things right on that, on, on the horizon. Okay, good. So, so now, you know, Hawking was able to compute the temperature. And now this is the first slide with equations, but this is really equations that, okay, are, are, uh, some of you will have done. For those of you who haven't done, don't worry about it. But you know, these are equations that, this equation all of you have read. In fact, in Hawking's book on a brief history of time, he said I'm allowed to put in one equation, which is this equation, okay, which is E is equal to mc squared. So indeed, you know, th there's some total energy in the black hole, right, which is E is equal to mc squared. And as we discussed, I had not planted that question, energy cannot be created through quantum fluctuations, right. So therefore, it must be that if you have the black hole is radiating, then the black hole must be losing energy. It has a finite amount of total energy. Okay? There is a rate at which it loses energy. That rate is go goes by what's called this name by the name of what's called the Stephen Boltzmann law. Doesn't matter what it is, but the rate at which the black hole loses energy is proportional to the fourth power of the temperature. But this is completely unimportant for understanding the basic principle, which is look, there's something which is hot, it's radiating, so it must be losing energy, right? That's just completely intuitive. You can use that to therefore calculate the fact that the mass of the black hole itself must be changing. You see why E is equal to mc square is important. If the energy goes down, the mass must be going down. So the black hole in quantum mechanics doesn't stay at a steady mass. In fact, it can lose mass and it continues to lose mass at a steady rate, which is given by Hawking radiation. What this means, if you take it through to a logical conclusion, is that black holes have a finite lifetime. You can calculate that lifetime from the equations I showed you previously. In four dimensions, the lifetime of a black hole is proportional to the cube of the mass, okay, to m cube. Okay. And the black hole has some lifetime which you can calculate with some numbers. But one way to think about it is that this lifetime for a solar mass black hole is 10 to the 67 years. And the reason it is so long is because the temperature of a solar mass black hole is so small, it is 10 to the minus 8 Kelvin. Does anyone know the age of the universe is? Very good. So you see 13.6 billion years is about 10 to the 13 years, okay, which is much, much, sorry, 10 to the 10 years, which is much, much, much smaller than this, right? It's 10 to the 57 times smaller, okay? So the universe itself is, you know, has, there hasn't been enough time for a solar mass black hole to evaporate in the universe, okay, which is just 10 to the 10 years old. On the other hand, you know, somebody asked if you can have black holes of smaller objects and indeed you can, okay. So if you took like, you know, a jumbo jet, which was 400 tons, you put it in the Bermuda Triangle where there is a black hole and the jumbo jet became a black hole, then that black hole would evaporate in 5 seconds, okay. So if you had a much smaller black hole, then that black hole could evaporate much faster okay, in 5 seconds. So these questions are interesting from a theoretical perspective. And as I told you in the beginning, remember in the beginning I said I had this picture of a giant pushing the sun or Hanuman eating the sun or you know trying to play with the sun. But the point is that physicists are fond of thinking of thought experiments of this kind because they lead us to interesting consequences, okay. So this issue of the evaporation of a black hole is not an issue that's relevant for astrophysical black holes, but it's an issue that could be relevant if we knew how to form smaller black holes and because such smaller black holes would have much smaller lifetimes, okay. So the point I've so far made is just that quantum fluctuations cause a black hole to radiate and therefore a black hole has a finite lifetime. Okay. Uh, 
uh, very quick question, but we, we are not taking questions, but go on, yes. What if the apple, what if the fluctuation the fluctuation does carry something out of the black hole, that's why the black hole is radiating. The fluctuation is carrying something out and that's why the black hole looks like it is radiating. What is happening is that the fluctuations are causing something to go out and something to go inside the black hole. That is why from outside it looks like you have radiation coming. That radiation is produced by fluctuations. Then things can go out of the black hole. Yes, exactly. So things can go out of the black hole and that's why the black hole has a finite lifetime because in quantum mechanics the black hole loses mass due to fluctuations. Exactly. Okay, good. So this is the story I told you so far, right? We had a black hole, we had a star, the star died, it formed a black hole. Due to quantum effect, the black hole radiates and the radiation follows a black body curve. It's a perfect black body, okay? So this brings us to what Hawking called the information paradox. Hawking said that, you know, the, the, the radiation that was coming from a black hole depends only on its mass, on the temperature which I showed you. So imagine you have star 1 which formed a black hole and you had star 2 which formed a black hole and these two stars were the same mass. Okay. Maybe one of them had more hydrogen, maybe the other had more helium, maybe one of them had a copy of Wikipedia, maybe the other didn't, okay. So maybe one of them had more information and the other didn't, right. Or maybe one of them had Wikipedia, the other had Britannica, so it had less information. <laughs> so, so, so <laughs> either way, right, so one of, they, have, they have different levels of information. But now, you know, both of them collapsed to form a black hole and then the black hole radiated and the radiation didn't care about, you know, what details it looks like in Hawking's formula. The radiation only depended on the mass. So it looks like both these black holes would lead to, lead to the same kind of radiation. And remember one of the things I emphasized at the beginning of this talk was that time evolution in physics is always considered to be reversible. So this is what is called the information paradox, which is that it looks like when you apply the principles of quantum mechanics to black holes, you end up with a process that looks fundamentally irreversible. Okay? So that is the information paradox. Okay? okay, good. Now let me try and explain how this, you know, what we understand about how to resolve this paradox. So this is what I said already that reversibility is a fundamental property and so this is a paradox. Good. So the answer that we understand pretty well is that Hawking's calculation was not exactly correct. It's not true that the radiation that comes out of a black hole is completely uncorrelated. It's formed due to, you know, fluctuations at the horizon. But in fact, there are also correlations between different amounts of radiation that are emitted, different radiation that might be emitted in different directions or at different times. This is a cartoon, okay, I emphasize it's a cartoon. It's not some real simulation. It's a cartoon that kind of shows a black hole and some random radiation that's been emitted. The reason I colored the dots is because the radiation you can think of as being photons and photons have different frequencies, right? So you can think of some random frequencies as having been emitted with some spectrum that's controlled by the Planck body spectrum, okay? But if you look at this, this is random, but if you look at it more closely, this is a cartoon I emphasize. This is not how real correlations in a black hole are formed. You will see that there's actually some correlations in the spectrum. Whenever there's a purple dot, you draw a line on the other side, you'll see a yellow dot. And whenever there's a red dot, you draw a line, you'll see there's a blue dot, okay? This is an example of how a system that might look seemingly random, at first sight it looks random and indeed if you look at the probability distribution of any individual photon, it is random. It's random because I generated it by a computer to be random. In fact, can have correlations when you look at the joint probability distribution of things that have been emitted. When you look at more than one part of a system or you look at a system more closely, it might have correlations that are very delicate. So we now understand that Hawking's calculation was not exactly correct and in fact the radiation that is emitted from a black hole is not exactly uncorrelated with what went in but rather it has delicate correlations which are sufficient to preserve the information that went in. Okay? So this is our understanding of how this issue is resolved. That Hawking's calculation is correct in that it's a first order calculation. It says the radiation is approximately thermal but it's not exactly correct in that the radiation is not exactly random, but there are delicate correlations and those delicate correlations are enough to preserve the information. Okay, now I'm going to spend about last five minutes of this talk saying, trying to explain to you why this happens, okay? So this is going to be a slightly more advanced uh, issue, but I'll try and make it as accessible as possible. But this is our understanding 
or this is in fact a topic of active research, but it's the understanding of, of some of us at least in the community for how it is that this forms, okay. So the question you might ask is, you know, I said that the radiation was formed from fluctuations at the horizon, right? So this is the black hole, this is the horizon. And I told you the radiation is formed from fluctuation. Something is emitted here, something is emitted here, right? And then this radiation is formed at the horizon and these particles which are caused by these fluctuations, they go far away, right? Now the infalling matter, the matter that formed the black hole is somewhere here. It's not at the horizon as I've said to you a few times, right? So you could ask how is it that the horizon, the radiation which emerges from the horizon has information about the matter which looks like it is not present at that point, okay? So I'm going to try and explain to you something that we understand about this uh, and I'll try and make it accessible but once again, uh, I apologize if not and you can ask me questions once I'm done, okay? Okay, good. So our understanding of how this works is what at least we call the principle of holography of information, okay? It is the following idea, it's the following principle which seems to work in quantum gravity, which is that whenever you have a situation of this kind, when you have some region and you have the complement of a region, okay, the complement is what you study in set theory in, in class 8th or 7th or whenever we study it, which is you look at everything apart from that region. So in this case, R is the region and R bar is the complement. And whenever the complement of the region surrounds the region, that doesn't always happen. You could have a region that's everything from here up to infinity in that direction. And then the complement would be everything from here up to infinity in this direction. And then the complement doesn't surround the region. But it might happen that you take the region to be the table and then the complement is everything outside the table and then the complement does surround the region. Okay. Whenever the complement of a region surrounds the region, then information in the region is also accessible in the complement by suitably precise measurement. Okay. It's a rather radical kind of statement because usually I would say there's some information in the laptop. It's not available outside the table, right? But the statement is that in quantum gravity, if you make suitably precise measurements of quantum gravitational observables, of which basically means, you know, space-time measurements of the metric of distances and lengths outside the table which are sufficiently precise, you can determine what's happening inside here. Once again, I emphasize this is an issue of principle. It's not that we have a technology right now to read off what's happening in the laptop, but as a matter of principle, this is how information is localized in a theory of gravity. So what this principle tells you, and I'll explain, I'll motivate for you why we believe something like this should be true, but the relevance to the paradox, yeah. uh, exactly, so information is not localized in quantum gravity, exactly. So in fact, exactly as you say, what this principle tells you is that if you had observers who were outside, they would always have access to the information that fell inside. And that is why the loss of, you know, the black hole evaporation does not lead to loss of information because the region outside always retains a copy of the information. Even the horizon which looks like it's separated from the matter always retains a copy of the information. So the radiation that's formed at the horizon is affected by what went inside. Okay? So the resolution to the paradox ultimately has to do with the unusual localization of information in quantum gravity, okay? Uh, there's a quick question, yes. Good, good, I, I, was, I was somewhat imprecise, you're right. Uh, th thank you for correcting me. Uh, I, you're right, I said copy and by copy I just mean that there are two ways of accessing the information but ultimately there's only one copy of the information. What I mean is that there is one way you could measure the information by me making measurements around the laptop. There's another observable which, you, which would try to measure the information by reading something directly in the laptop. They are accessing the same information. So it's not like the information is duplicated but there are two ways to measure it. So thank you for, for pointing that out. Okay. okay, good. So now I'm going to explain to you why we think that something so crazy should be true in quantum gravity, okay? I, I mean, we, we do think it's true, there are many calculations that support it, but I'll try and explain in five minutes why we think it should be true. Okay, so this, so I'm going to take a step back, okay? So this is for people who studied some amount of quantum mechanics. As you know, in quantum, and as we also discussed, in quantum mechanics, there's some uncertainty, right? And there's something which is very, very fundamental to quantum mechanics, which is called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And one of the consequences of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is that if you take a state which has definite energy, okay, it has, in that you, its energy has a fixed value, then its position is indefinite. Okay. So the kind of state 
usually Heisenberg uncertainty is phrased using momentum and position, but you can also phrase it using energy and position in a relativistic theory. So, a theory uh, some, uh, if you have a particle it has a definite energy and its position is always spread out. Okay. So, this is what is called the wave function sometimes it is spread out. That does not usually prevent us from forming states which have which are localized, right, which are really localized even in quantum mechanics those of you who have studied it. The way we form such states in fact is by the superpositions I described earlier. You take a uh, something which has a wave function which is of this kind in position space and you take another one which is a wave function of a different kind. See this one has a peak here and this one has a bump here and you take a third different wave function which is of a third different kind and in quantum mechanics you can superpose them just like we superpose waves. When you superpose waves you all you know you know there is a phenomena called constructive interference in that the waves can interfere constructively in one region and destructively outside that is what you see with the diffraction grating. If you hold up a CD you see the colors you see a rainbow and the reason you see the rainbow is because the light is interfering constructively at one region and destructively in another region. So, in some places the light adds up in some places it does not add up. So, you can ensure by taking states of different energies necessarily different energies you can ensure that the wave that the states uh, this wave function or this probability distribution interferes constructively in one region and destructively outside. That gives rise to what is called a localized state. That is how we usually localize information in quantum mechanics without gravity. Why do things change in gravity? In gravity there is something which is very fundamental which is the fact that the energy can be measured from infinity. What that means is something very simple. You know how do we know the mass of the sun? Do you know what the mass of the sun is? Exactly ok good. How do we know that? No one has been to the sun. Exactly. So, you see in gravity we can measure the mass from a distance. You do not actually have to go there to measure the mass right. This is an example of what is called the Gauss law. Okay. The Gauss law tells you that if you take the gravitational field and you integrate it on a sphere it tells you the total mass inside. So, the way we know the total mass of the sun is not because we have gone there and we have measured every little part of the sun. It is because the gravitational field extends out and by measuring it you can determine the mass of the field. And what is more you cannot shield the gravitational field. You know there is a similar Gauss law for those of you who have studied electrodynamics for charges, but you can shield charges. You know if I tell you how much charge there is inside here you do not actually know because there could be some positive and negative charge. But with mass you cannot shield mass ok. And so, gravity is, is special in that the energy can be measured from infinity and how is that relevant to this issue of localizing information that I described. You see you have to think a little bit about how states would behave in a theory of quantum gravity. I am giving you right now a heuristic argument, but you see remember I said states have a wave function which is some tells you the probability distribution of the state being found at some position, but there is another degree of freedom that has to be associated with every state, every such state of a particle. If you have an electron, the electron has to have also a gravitational field and that gravitational field knows about the mass of the electron. So, there is no such thing in a theory of gravity as simply an excitation of some matter particle without the gravitational field. So, in a theory of gravity every such excitation that you make necessarily comes accompanied with a gravitational field and that gravitational field is sufficient to measure its energy. Now, go back to this process that we had of trying to localize things by adding up you know states of different energy so as to achieve constructive interference in one region and destructive interference outside. The problem is now that you cannot do that because you know you might have done that if you had only these states of the electron or whatever particle you are studying. But now there is also an additional degree of freedom which is the gravitational field which is extending out to infinity and it is different for all these cases because the energy of this wave function is some E 1, this one is E 2, this one is E 3. And so, while you might arrange for these parts of this wave function to interfere destructively in the presence of gravity you cannot arrange for both the field of your matter particle and the gravitational field to interfere destructively outside the bounded region ok. So, that is a heuristic explanation for why it is that gravity localizes information unusually ok. This is another way this is a cartoon now. So, what I said was technical, but now those of you for whom that was uh, you know uh, that, that was cryptic uh, and now what I am saying is simple this is the fundamental property. In a theory without gravity you can have states of this kind which have this is a cartoon where you have an excitation here in the table and everything outside looks exactly like the vacuum ok. 
I can have something happening inside this room and people outside have no inkling of what's happening. It's possible to arrange such states in theories without gravity. After some time, of course, our voice will carry and people will know, but at an instant, you can arrange so that people there are completely ignorant of what's happening inside. You can change what's happening inside this region and keep the region outside unchanged. The point I tried to make right now, I didn't give you a proof, but the, the argument I tried to suggest is that in the theory of gravity, you can't do this. If you create some excitation in some region, you have to have gravitational tails that go outside. This is also true in classical gravity. When you create an excitation, there's a gravitational field that goes outside. But in classical gravity, you can change the distribution of mass inside a region so as to keep the field outside unchanged. In a theory of quantum gravity, you can't even do that. If you change the form of this excitation, even while keeping the total mass unchanged, you change the form of these tails. And by reading these tails effectively, you can determine what's happening inside. That's the fundamental difference between how gravity localizes information as opposed to other theories. Okay, okay so going back to this, I'm coming to the end now. You know, going back to this black hole, you know, there's some, some, what this says is there's some information that might be accessible near this blue dot, but there are some other observables near these red dots that can also actually access the same information, even though it looks like it's spatially separated. And this is not because, you know, the information is jumping from here to here, but because there are constraints that relate or correlations that relate the information here to the information here. And so even though while in the classical theory it looks like that the horizon was information free, it's not really true. Okay. So you could go back and say, you know, what was the mistake in Hawking's argument for information loss? Hawking said information is lost and there are two errors and there are two, two, two things which go into the resolution of the information paradox. One of them is that just because, you know, simple observables in Hawking radiation, which means, you know, you measure the light coming out or some other waves, just because they look thermal, it doesn't mean that microscopically the state has lost information. There might be delicate correlations between different observables that preserve the information. Second, we have an understanding of how those correlations are formed. And the way they're formed is through the fact that quantum gravity localizes information very differently, both from classical gravity and from non-gravitational theories. Okay. So these two aspects are things which were not known at the time of Hawking. But these are the two ingredients that we've understood much better that help us resolve the seeming inconsistency between gravity and quantum mechanics. Okay, let me end with a philosophical slide. You know, at the beginning of this talk, I emphasized this issue of locality, right? I said, well, you know, we had a Newtonian theory of gravity. We had the sun and the earth and they attracted each other at a distance. And we didn't like that because we said we don't like non-locality. And so we introduced, in the end, some fabric of space-time to get banish non-locality from the world and say, you know, we want things which are exactly local. And now when you add quantum mechanics and you add gravity and think more carefully about that, you find that you can't quite banish non-locality. This is not non-locality in the sense of Newton's law. Nothing is jumping from one point to the other. But rather what's happening is that the constraints on states are such that you can never exactly localize information. Information always spreads out in a theory of gravity. And it spreads out so much that it's sufficient to resolve these seeming paradoxes that appear. Okay, so it's kind of a progression of perspectives on, on gravity and space-time that went from saying, you know, we want exact locality to now recognizing that, you know, the loss of locality is sometimes important uh, to preserve the consistency of the theory. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say. Uh, thank you and thank you for your patience. I'll stop here and we can take more questions. Okay, so now there are many questions which you avoided, so I'm happy to take them. Some question there also. Please, please raise your hand if you have any question. We'll bring the mic to you. I think some question is there also. So when I first saw the poster, I thought you would tell something about how to create a time machine. <laughs> I, I don't know how to create a time machine. That's not believed to be possible with respect to current uh, uh, theories. I mean, current theories of physics don't allow you to create time machines, whatever that means. I mean, what does a time machine mean? We can go backwards no. and at our will. No, that's not, you know, in fact, physics is even more boring than that. Physics tells you that you can't change, you know, everything is, physics allows for what's called super linear time. You can neither change the past nor the future. Everything is determined. And one more question was like, in movies they show Superman goes above and rotates around the earth and time reverses. So what is your take on that? <laughs> I don't watch Superman, but I don't know what to say. Uh, time doesn't reverse. I mean, I don't know what, what, um, um, uh, I, I, I don't have anything to say about that. It, it's just in the movies. You should okay. just leave it in. Not, not to be sir. taken seriously, yeah. So you talked about... Rearrange everything in the universe. 
So it's possible to recalculate things. So it's possible to reverse time evolution the following way. In that you can take a system and you can set it up so that you know it, it starts evolving in that you know you reverse the time evolution that you can do. And you can have a ball you rotate it this way and then you can reverse time evolution making it rotate the other way. That's not time going backwards. Uh, so you Time won't reverse, but it's true that evolution will reverse. It lets other people also ask questions, but yeah, go on, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so in one of the universe ending scenarios, if we talk about the heat death of the universe. Yes, yes. When in very distant future, all the supermassive black holes have also evaporated and there's yeah. nothing remaining in the universe. How is the information still preserved? How is the information that we have currently in the universe still yeah. preserved in that state? You know, heat death never talks, never leads to loss of information. What, that's like saying, you had some ripples, right? And the ripples, uh, uh, you know, uh, died away. So it looked like things reached equilibrium. So when people talk about that's generally what's called an increase in entropy. Okay. So, but that doesn't ever involve the loss of information because the information is still preserved in delicate correlations between different things. So that state that you have is not exactly a mixed state. It ha it still has correlations between different parts of the universe, and those correlations are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the correlations that existed earlier. It is true that earlier the information was easier to access in a sense and now it's harder to access, but it's still present. Uh, sir, you made a statement that uh, mass cannot be shielded, but uh, we know that uh, through gravitational lensing, the amount of ma mass that has been observed from outside is uh, far more less than what is actually there. So how do we account for the uh, mass that… Maybe you're talking about dark matter. Uh, gravitational lensing. What, what oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're dark matter. That's yeah. not a question of gravitational lensing. That's just a question that the visible matter that we observe in the universe doesn't look like it is, so if you look at galactic rotation curves, the, so indeed mass can't be shielded and the galactic rotation curves can be used to determine how much mass is present in some area or in some volume. And the visible matter that you see is not sufficient to account for that, that mass. And so people introduce a hypothesis of dark matter where you say, look, there's additional matter that you can't see, but the mass has not been shielded. It's not visible to you. So you have to distinguish between mass that's not visible and that's been shielded. Thank you. But uh, if, we, if we rearrange everything in the universe, uh, like it was one second ago, then it's okay, it will be lost. No, information will not be lost. If you rearrange everything in the universe as it was one second ago, the, the one past one second will repeat as it had previously. The same but evolution will happen. Will no, information will still not be lost because it, that information is still present in evolution. We'll discuss later. <laughs> we'll have a lot of time to discuss later. <laughs> yeah. Sir, <laughs> yeah. uh, so you talked about uh, reversibility at a point, and uh, uh, so so uh, it's just a speculation. So let's say we are in space and we don't have a lot of things to observe. All we have is a glass of water with some sugar dissolved in it, okay. right? So uh, well, uh, you talked about entropy, right? So it's very unlikely that we'll find that sugar suddenly just you know, separates out, out, out of the water. Okay. But let's just say it happens okay. and we keep repeating that. So if it happens once, we might, it's a very unlikely thing, it may, may not happen at all, but still we might conclude just unlikely. But let's say we keep repeating that and it keeps happening. What would be a rational conclusion? Is the third law of thermodynamics just wrong? Or the second law. Sorry, is the second law just wrong or time is going back? <laughs> if it keeps happening. If it keeps happening. Well, uh, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, that's um, I, I, what you're, the, the counterfactual you're phrasing is something that won't happen, right? So, you, you know, the, the second law of thermodynamics arises from a very robust statistical property. Mm. It is simply the fact that there are many more ways for the sugar to be dissolved yeah. in the water than there are for the sugar to be outside. Okay? So, it's just that robust fact that leads to the second law of thermodynamics. So, it's very hard to violate the second law of thermodynamics in. in so, you know, to say, when you say counterfactually, if you see it keeps happening, uh, that's like saying that, you know. Very uh, unlikely things are happening uh, again and again and again. Yeah, so it's so like saying that the, that the rules of physics as we understand them are not being obeyed, right? So, if the rules of physics as we understand them are, are, are not being obeyed, then, uh, uh, you know, then, uh, um, I mean, you know, you could arrange for a situation, you could arrange for some exceptional initial state 
where such a thing kept happening again and again. It would be something very unlikely, but it would be consistent with the rules of physics. So, you know, at every point you would find, at least presumably you would find, or that's what you have in mind, you would find that all the equations of motion are being obeyed. It's just that we happen to be in an extremely unlikely state, and in that extremely unlikely state, it looks like, you know, uh, this unusual thing is happening. So, what looks like it's being reversed here is what you're calling the thermodynamic arrow of time. You know, how do we decide what is in the future and what's in the past? One way to decide it is by, in fact, looking at the flow of entropy. And by setting up a thermodynamic arrow of time, right? If I show you a movie, how do you know it's running forward as opposed to running backwards? It's by, it's because we have an understanding of what are higher entropy situations. Okay? If I show you a movie where you have a stone falling into a ripple and the ripple spreading out, you would know that's being played forward. If I play you the same movie backwards, all the equations of motion are being obeyed, but you know that's something that's very unlikely. So it's true in the situation you're in, it would look like the thermodynamic arrow of time has been reversed, and that's fine. You know, that can happen in unusual situations, in a very sir, unusual situation, sir, if you arrange for things. Sir? Yeah. Uh, the question is regarding the information paradox. So like, uh, is it true that like the particle is uh, changing the space-time fabric so that it is leaving some information? Is it like that actually? Uh, you, you can think of it that way. It's not the particle, more that the collapsing star when it collapsed, yeah. okay? change not just the space-time fabric, but here you have to talk about, the, you know, earlier we talked about the fabric of space-time. That's what's called a classical notion. Here there is, you have to talk, think of a wave function of those fabrics of space-time. Okay. So mm -hmm. in that the fabric of space-time itself can have different configurations with different probabilities, like you have a wave function. And you can indeed say that the collapsing star kind of left an imprint on that quantum fabric of the space-time which preserves the information. Okay, so even if that is happening, like the exact information is not like reflecting on that fabric it of... It is. It is. So the, 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 in, theoretically, I mean, you know, these are all thought experiments. It is. It, it, so it, you can indeed re exactly recover information from outside that went inside. So, you know, the, the theory is that that's exactly what you can do. Like, uh, I have read something uh, rela uh, related to the gravitational wave, which is called the memory effect. That is, I got this connection. So, like in memory effect, it is told that, uh, like, uh, the gravitational waves can uh, permanently change the fabric of the space time, but it should be an asymptote, like a flat space. Like, there should be no energy and mass in that space. The like, memory effect is a different effect. It's, what's, it's okay. a classical effect. It has to do with the fact that if you have some detectors which are just sitting around and a gravitational wave passes through them, it can rearrange the detectors, it can change the configuration of the detectors. That's just a classical effect. The thing I'm talking about is something that happens, on, your memory effect is something you can hope to observe. Okay. Uh, the thing I'm talking about is something that happens when you combine the effects of quantum mechanics and gravity. It is not directly related to the memory effect. Okay, so from the theory, like, it is very clear that whatever the information is there, like, whatever the distortions are there, the information is clearly retrieved. Yes. Okay, like, any technology. Any diplomacy. Te technology, like. No, 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 there's no technology, you know, that's, and the reason for that is roughly because quantum gravity, because gravity is such a weak force. One way to see that is to say that when you pick up this thing, you're acting against the gravitational force of the entire earth, right? That's how I pick it up and I throw it. The whole earth is trying to pull it down, but I'm able to defeat the whole earth. I mean, how? Because the electromagnetic forces in my hand and the ball are much stronger than the force of gravity. So gravity at the scales, if you observe it, is very weak in our universe. And quantum, so effects of quantum gravity, are, that's why, you know, even gravitational waves, like these ripples of space-time, formed from very violent objects like black holes, took very, a lot of experimental work to observe. Now, if you ask questions about Hawking radiation, like solar mass black holes are extremely cool. Their temperatures of 10 to the minus 8 Kelvin. That's actually much lower than the temperature of the cosmic microwave background. That's already, you know, 2 Kelvin. It's like 100 million times hotter. So these are things which have very, very weak effects. So it's not like there is, forget about technology, there's not even a direct experimental verification of any of these effects, but they are theoretical effects that you get led to by putting together things that you have verified in other experiments. So the principles of gravity that you're putting together and the principles of quantum mechanics are things you've verified in other experiments. And you're asking what would happen if you put them together consistently. Um, sir, um, yeah. if going back in time, if it is possible, which way is most accepted by physicists globally? What does going back in, I think going back, this is a somewhat ill-defined question. You know, going back in time can mean, it's true that you could, you could set up a situation where, you know, uh, uh, you somehow de-age someone. Like, you know, that's something you could do with enough effort. Or you could recreate a replica of the world as it existed some time ago. Okay? Yeah. You can't do that with the real world, but you can do that with this. 
So going back as time is something like this. Look, the ball is here, now it went here, right? Now going back in time means I can put the ball back here. That's, that's what going back in time means, that I rearrange things as they were some time ago. You can do that in, sir, a, in a subsystem, not in the whole world. Sir, and with enough effort in some, in some other system, that's sir, all going back in time is. Uh, theoretically, I heard that if you go very uh, close to the speed of light, everything around you just slows down. Correct. And uh, actually, you have uh, traveled forward, uh, uh, like everything uh, has been fastened, like you are, you have, you are forward in time. So the world around you is way further than you. This so is not, not theoretical. It's the okay, fact sir. that mm -hmm. that uh, you know uh, it's it's the way your GPS and your phone works. The way the GPS and the phone works, it has to take in terms of time dilation. If you if you put a very accurate atomic clock on the plane and make it go around the world, mm -hmm. it'll you know it'll it'll be behind the clock that's that's sitting somewhere else. So it's indeed true if you have if you have a two twins and one twin goes out and comes back that twin will be younger than the twin who stayed back on earth. That's an effect of what's called special relativity. It doesn't involve time travel in the way people are talking about it in movies. No, it's true that there are various effects of space and time which are very interesting which come from relativity. And maybe that's what you're referring to. And this is something which is not theoretical. You can measure it experimentally. You take an atomic clock, put it in a plane, let it go around. It will read differently from an atomic clock that sits on, on So the right now there is no way to go to a world uh, years from now. Uh, what does that mean? It's true that you can go out in some in some spaceship and come back and uh, you know maybe you can come back after thousand years while you have aged only ten years. That's completely consistent with relativity. We don't have the technology to do that but there's nothing inconsistent with that. You can keep traveling so in your life it looks like it's ten years and a thousand years have passed on Earth. That's possible. There's nothing, no contradiction with the principles of physics. Okay. Uh, I have a question. question here. Uh, Okay, here, yeah. Before I ask my question, I would like a little clarity on delicate correlation. What, okay. what exactly? Delicate correlations just meant that, you know, uh, correlations which, good. So delicate is a, was a technical term. Those correlations are suppressed by some parameter which has to do with the entropy of the system, number of microstates. It's the following kind of question. Let's say I, I hit this, this thing and some ripples forms. And now I ask you, reconstruct the force with which I hit it. You would need to make measurements at an accuracy which had to do with first the entropy of this water, in fact the exponential of the entropy of the water. Okay, that's the accuracy that you would need to reconstruct this. So when you say delicate, it just means that you have to make very accurate measurements in order to be able to reconstruct the information. I mean that's why things around us often look irreversible because the information becomes very hard to access. So delicate correlations just meant that, that there are correlations which are, which are you know very hard to observe but they are present and they're enough to get the information. Uh, so speaking from a statistical point of view, a delicate correlation would only mean that you're trying to find, uh, a delicate correlation wouldn't hold much ground. Uh, so wouldn't hold much ground, why? Because you're, you're just finding some tiny correlation between two no, things no. that might exist anywhere. No, no, what it means is that you can have two states, uh, I, I, I don't know what level, it, at what technical level I should explain this, but you can have two different probability distributions so that when you measure, you know, maybe the first few moments, you can't distinguish between them. But you have to go to very high moments in order to be able to distinguish between them. So you can have, in fact, in quantum mechanics, uh, this is almost a very typical property and that's in fact where things thermalize. If you look at most states, most states have the property that most observables in most states uh, look completely typical, okay. And in fact, information is stored in observables when you measure them to very high accuracy in these delicate correlations. Uh, and that's how, so you know, uh, it, this is in fact a very robust statistical property. If you take most states, most observables in most states look uh, like uh, completely typical. And information is stored in these, precisely in these delicate correlations. Uh, so because we, uh, we are calculating it at a high accuracy uh, yes. model, we are, uh, we are accepting the delicate correlation. No, it's, it's the fact that, um, how do I say it? You know, let's say I gave you a, I don't know, are you, are you a statistics uh, student? Uh, you know, let's say I give you a distribution and I told you, look, the first moment is this and the second moment is something, okay? And the, the oh, by the way, the fourth moment also has the same property that it does for a Gaussian. That doesn't mean the distribution is Gaussian. There are an infinite number of distributions that have the same moments, right? And that information is stored in higher moments, which might be hard to observe, you know, maybe if the standard deviation is small, but that, those higher moments have a lot of information. That's roughly what's being said here. Yeah. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk and it, it was quite interesting. The question that I have is uh, when you have 
quantum tunneling. So how is information preserved when there is quantum tunneling occurring? Uh, quantum tunneling was not very relevant to what I said. You know, the way quantum tunneling is, well, it's used in different ways, but often it has to do with the fact that sometimes, uh, you know, I mean, maybe quantum tunneling is, is you can think of as, as being relevant for the formation of Hawking radiation Correct. itself. Uh, but uh, that doesn't, um, I, I didn't quite understand the question. Why is that related to the issue of? No, I, I'm just saying that how is information preserved in, in quantum tunneling? So information is always preserved in quantum, you know, quantum tunneling, we don't need to talk about black holes or something. Correct. When, it when, doesn't. when yeah. a neutron decays, you can think of that as quantum tunneling. Okay. So when, when you have when you have atoms decay, you can often think of that as quantum tunneling, where you had some electron which was behind some potential barrier, it came outside the potential barrier. In such processes, information is always preserved. In that, if you take the full wave function, that okay. full wave function evolves in a way so that the information is always preserved. It's true that you know it looks like the electron was behind and then it came outside, but the final state is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the initial state. So quantum tunneling is just the fact that sometimes the classically an object cannot go from here to here. There's a potential barrier between them. But quantum mechanically, it can go from here to here. But that doesn't change the fact that quantum mechanics is fundamentally reversible, just like classical mechanics is. If you measured the wave function of the object outside, you would still be able to reconstruct the initial state. So quantum tunneling doesn't have, doesn't change reversibility. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sir, we have a few questions from okay. you too. Yeah. So the first one is figurative compression will emit energy or reduction in mass. If so, will that have an impact on space-time fabric, which would have ripple effect on entire cosmos? Can you read the what 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 compression? What is the first thing? Figurative compression will emit energy or reduction in mass. Figurative compression. I don't know what that means. I don't know what figurative compression means. Okay. So I don't know how to answer the question yet. Okay. So the next question is. Please tell something about static charged black hole and Reinser Nordstrom metric. Okay, so you know the black holes I was talking about were black holes which were not charged, uh, but uh, you can think of a black hole where you put a charge, and uh, such a black hole leads to a different kind of black hole. It's called a Reinser Nordstrom black hole. It's related to a question that was asked earlier from here about a curved black hole, which is a black hole which has angular momentum. A black hole can also have charge. So I think we'll That's the only question. Maybe we can have the last question since he's had <laughs> his hand. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll have a hard time anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Come> on, <yes. laughs> You've forgotten the question. <laughs> He'll remember it later. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Okay, one more question. Huh? Yeah. Uh, so what, uh, if, if we recreate <laughs> the, uh, everything that was one second ago, then uh, 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 the information will not be lost means uh, there has to be infinite information. I don't understand that question completely. But what do you mean by if you recreate something one second ago, why, why are you thinking information will be lost? Where is the loss of information? That's why information, there has to be infinite information. You think information that, that you collected in the one second, that was lost, that's what you mean? Yes. Ah, good. So information is not accrued in that way. Information doesn't increase with time. In physics, information just means the full details of the state. That's what information means. So information doesn't increase with time. It's not like as time goes forward, the amount of information that you have increases. The amount of information that you have remains always exactly the same in, in the physical sense. It may be that the amount of information we gain increases in that as experimenters or as human beings, we have access to some information we didn't have earlier. But the sense in which information was being used earlier was just that information was being referred to as the de complete details of the state. And that doesn't change. It was the same one second ago and it is the same one second further. It might be true that we have gained some information and we can forget some information. So the fact that human beings have gained or lost some information is not the question of information loss. Information loss is a question of whether given the, all the details of the state, is that information conserved or is it not conserved? And that is supposed to be conserved in physics. It's not about what we know. So we can forget information. That is not in contradiction with physics. If, if you know, our, we stop working, our brain stops working, we forget, or as you had forgotten your question right now, that was not in contradiction with any law of physics. Uh, so yes. this is uh, a radical thought experiment, but um, taking special theory of relativity into consideration, how energy and mass are uh, interchangeable, uh, assuming that, uh, let's just consider a person goes into a black hole and uh, he starts radiating, I mean, the black hole starts radiating this Hawking energy, uh, uh, Hawking radiation, and this energy that's present is somewhat tangible and is related 
and is correlated to that person. Would that imply that it is possible to, uh, say, convert this energy back into specific mass and uh, enabling us to say, teleport? Yeah, it's not teleportation. It is the fact that it's a, it's the fact that indeed, when when the person falls inside, eventually, if you collect all the radiation and everything, you could reconstruct what fell in. But you know, this is a very theoretical thing. It's the following sense: if you burn a piece of paper and you collect all the radiation, all the photons, everything. You can reconstruct what was written on the paper. That's not something that's practically possible. All this theory is telling you is that that's also true for black holes. You can think of black holes as being shredders, but no shredder is perfect, not even black holes. Yeah, so I think we'll wind up today's session by this question. And we have a small gift for you, sir. So Madhusudan and sir, yeah, so, yeah. he's not around. I'll give it on behalf yeah, of so you. Yeah, so Anupam Ghosh will hand over the gift for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. So, yeah, we have one more outreach event, which is named as Max Circle. Actually, it's for school students from 6th standard to 12th standard. And it's, it's for students who are really interested in mathematics. And it happens every alternate uh, Fridays. And we have it online as well as we are going to start the offline session at RRI. So there are some brochures outside and you can just collect it if you're interested, if you know somebody who's really interested in mathematics. So you can just collect the brochures and you can also visit the ICTS website where the, we have more details about the session and you can just uh, apply, uh, register for the, uh, for the Mac Circle and there'll be a small question paper there. You, your, ch your child can answer the question paper and submit it, that's it. So you can collect the brochures, and my colleague Roshni is there. She is taking, in, uh, she is in charge of the Mac Circle. She'll tell you more about the session if you are interested. Yeah, that's it.